Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this event to mark the launch of the 2021 EURICEF report entitled Fostering Investor Impact, Placing It at the Heart of Sustainable Finance. My name is Will Alton. I'm the president of EURICEF and delighted to have you with us this morning. On the eve of the COP discussions which take place in Glasgow next month, and as noted by Stefan Kruiskamp in the foreword to this year's report, sustainability remains one of the most pivotal topics of this decade. At EURICEF, we couldn't agree more. The last 12 months have seen a significant change in the industry with the introduction of new regulation from the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation launched in March this year to the preparations for the soon to be implemented EU taxonomy regulation in January next year. There has been much debate about the merits of the regulation and some of the challenges and issues around the implementation have been much debated. No doubt this morning in the panels that we have to follow, similar issues will be discussed in detail. EURICEF and its members fully support the policy intent of the EU's regulatory programme. The policy objectives we totally support in terms of meeting the Paris climate goals, supporting the EU's contribution to the sustainable development goals, and particularly for our industry, combating any proliferation of greenwashing, which is the exaggeration of claims within financial products for commercial gain, not something we want to see proliferate across the market. However, challenges remain in the implementation of the regulatory programme. Um, some may argue that at times the implementation has seemed somewhat chaotic as calls for clarity um, and firm timelines have gone at times it seems unheeded. Today's discussions will no doubt explore many of these issues in far greater detail. Those of you who have followed the progress of EURICEF's reporting over the past 10 plus years will recognise that this year's report is somewhat different. In the past, every two years, we've attempted to track assets under management flowing into different approaches to sustainable and responsible investment from traditional um, approaches such as negative screening, um, sustainability themed impact investment, etc. Going forward, that is not the narrative or lexicon that we across the European bloc will be using. Today, we will be talking about Article 6, 8 or 9 type products. So you will see that today there is no tracking of assets under management in those formally covered approaches to sustainable and responsible investment. Today's report marks a baseline for the future, where our intent is to be able to monitor the success or other of the EU's policy mechanisms as to whether they're achieving their policy goals. So today sets out some recommendations, some challenges, and some other information for practitioners and policy makers to set the scene for our work going forward. So there's a major difference that, that should be noted. All that leads me to do um, at this moment is really to thank the people who've been supporting us to get to the production of this document today. So they are DWS as sponsors, uh, along with ISS, um, Universal Investment, BMP, Parabar Asset Management, and LGT. So thank you for those who made the report possible and contributed to its production. Also to the National CIF members of EURICIF, EURICIF who play a vital part in all the work that EURICIF uh, undertakes. And particularly for the project manager who um, led the work on the creation of a report today, Kiyoko Sakumakek, who did a fantastic job in gathering uh, views, the many different views and diverse views of, uh, are contained in the report today um, across Europe. So thank you very much to Kiyoko and also the EURICEF team who you will hear from some of those later today. 
So on that, it just leaves me to welcome you once again. Thank you for your participation in today. I hope you enjoy the debate and the discussion. Thank you to all the people who've taken time out of their busy diaries to participate in the panels and discussions this morning. I hope you enjoy that. And now I will take uh, the, the opportunity to hand over to Eurosif's Executive Director, Victor Van Horn, who will provide the highlights of this year's report. So once again, thank you for your participation and joining us today. And over to Victor to take on proceedings from here. Thank you very much, Will. And good morning to everyone. And thank you for uh, dialing in and joining us this morning uh, in uh, you know, the launch of this, uh, I think, quite uh, interesting change of uh, focus, as Will explained, uh, where really our intent was to focus on uh, how do we understand investor impact? What are we trying to do with it? And also, how do we ensure that this you know, becomes a core focus uh, when policymakers are considering uh, further steps and are considering uh, how uh, sustainable finance can contribute to some of the broader societal and public policy goals that they consider, be it around climate change or biodiversity uh, preservation or social uh, indicators and impacts. So this morning, I'll first of all provide you with a really uh, short introduction and overview of the report, which you know I'm sure you'll uh, all eagerly read in more detail uh, uh, to, to see what uh, the background has been to some of our uh, recommendations and choices. And really, moving on through the report, I think it's fair to say that over the last couple of years, we've seen an incredible amount of action being undertaken in the financial industry, in policy making uh, around the issue of sustainability and of sustainable finance. And I think as Will quite rightly uh, identified it with the introduction of new regulations in the EU, I think the amount of discussions and interest and concentration on these issues is really increasing. However, despite this increasing action, uh, we always have to turn to science to say, you know, what the state of our planet Earth is looking like. And unfortunately, uh, you know, science is telling us that the state of the Earth is deteriorating rather than improving. improving. If you look, for example, at the very interesting research done around the concept of planetary boundaries, you will see uh, that, uh, unfortunately, we are gradually crossing some of those planetary boundaries uh, in the sustainability of the Earth, and that we are not on track uh, to, uh, you know, re to stay within reasonable boundaries that will avoid us entering, a, you know, an un on the, you know, uncharted waters about tipping points and unforeseen consequences of climate change and other, uh, you know, major sustainability challenges that we face. Furthermore, for example, recently the International Energy Agency confirmed that, uh, unfortunately, you know, with the improvement we saw as a result of the uh, COVID lockdowns, which, uh, you know, put the world economy to a standstill, unfortunately, we're very close now to having used, if you, you know, pardon the expression, that COVID dividend in terms of emissions, and we're nearly back to where we were before. So I think in you know, the, 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 the saying that after COVID, everything would be different and that we would be building back better. I think we have to be conscious of, of, of where we are and, and, and whether we've succeeded in that mission or not and what we need to do differently. And I think, you know, while Will mentioned that in a couple of weeks, we will have the COP26 on climate, only recently the COP15 on biodiversity and nature uh, concluded. And unfortunately, as we have been you know, seeing across this year in different reports and flagship publications, uh, the ecological footprint of humanity is far exceeding the capacity of the Earth's biosphere to sustain itself and regenerate itself. So essentially all the signals from a scientific perspective aren't great. And also it's been crossing, you know, it's become increasingly clear prior to COP26 that the window of opportunity to meet the Paris Climate Agreement goals is fast closing. Uh, 
we are more and more gathering evidence and getting information on the size of the challenge ahead of us, this, the magnitude of the changes that we need to orchestrate in the economy, uh, and how that will all really require us to do a profound rethink of production processes, how we make them circular, resource efficient, and how ultimately the biggest challenge we face is how do we ensure still economic growth, which uh, brings prosperity, uh, but we managed to decouple further economic growth from a necessarily an increase in you know greenhouse gas emissions, which something with that correlation has been very strong if you look at the history of the last you know century or more. Therefore, looking at the state of, of the planet, it's for us no doubt that in the future, particularly financial sector and investors, we really need to think very, you know, strategically, very uh, focused, in a very focused manner on how our actions, uh, how the, uh, our, you know, potentially triggering, triggering generate uh, positive outcomes and impact. And also to think very carefully about the, you know, investor impact, what investors are uniquely positioned to do. And I think here, it's good to pause for a moment and clarify that concept. And I think it's really the distinction between what are the impacts generated by the companies that investor invest in, which, which tend to be the largest share of impacts generated uh, in the economy and society in, in planet, and really what is the impact attributable to investors themselves? How are investors, financial institutions, and you know, catalyst for change and can they trigger change to hopefully generate positive impact as a result. And here academic research really tells us that they're broadly at this stage, and it's a very nascent research, but at this stage, three major mechanisms or levers that investors and in financial institution have. One, we've known it for a while, is shareholder engagement, engaging with the companies you're investing, engaging with them First of all, to understand what the plans are to meet the sustainability goals. Secondly, understand whether those plans are you know, uh, fit for purpose, whether they match with scientific evidence, and accompany those companies uh, by providing capital in this journey. The second thing is also focusing very much as an investor in your, the role of providing capital. And providing capital, particularly to you know, capital constrained companies or the funded projects that are nevertheless key to the transition to attain some of those sustainability goals. We'll get back to that later on this morning and further in the panel, so hopefully today, uh, about uh, how we need to really rethink that and focus on what is necessary to meet those goals, what kind of capital and financing is necessary for that, and where it's currently not the case, why are these investments not happening and how can investors help and where do they need to build coalition with others and particularly policymakers to achieve that. And the third lever is really collectively as sustainable investors, the ability to send you know, strong signals, market signals to companies about the need to take sustainability seriously, uh, to, to, to have that at the forefront of their agenda and to really understand uh, what investors are expecting in the, uh, from uh, those companies and here i think it's you know in the report this year looking at the first lever of shareholder engagement we do want to have a special focus uh on the you know the possibilities of engagement but as well as uh, unfortunately also the limits and where investors will in our view need to really rethink how to extend uh, engagement with investing companies and complement it in the longer run with advocacy and public policy. And if we for a moment pause and look at the specific context of climate change. As a number of studies, but particularly an interesting report end of the last year by McKinsey showed, uh, we need a very large <laughs> amount of capital between now and 2050 to fund the necessary investments uh, to make sure, uh, and here we're talking about only about Europe, uh, that Europe meets the net zero uh, objectives. Obviously, we all know that climate is not a, a geographically limited phenomenon, so uh, it's not only Europe, but the rest of the world which will need to go on that journey. 
But in the case of Europe, which is you know a very developed uh, economy, uh, very advanced in its industrialization, what you see is that at this stage, estimates are that between now and 2050, around 50 percent, in the close range to half of the investments required, do not currently have a standalone investment case. Unfortunately, that means that they're not at this stage for companies or investors in those companies necessarily the rational choice to make. They're not the investments that will get private capital funded right now. And as a result, you can engage with those companies to get them to be more sustainable. But because of the necessity for those companies to still you know, remain viable businesses that make a sufficient amount of profit, and also are able to you know, dialogue with their investors and so ensure that their investors uh, in line with their fiduciary duty generate you know, in sufficient investment returns for their clients. At this stage, they're not going to be the investments that need to, that are going to be made. But as a result also, uh, we have to be cognizant that there may be limits to how much uh, shareholder engagement may be effective with those companies. Those investments, which are vital to, for us to reach to Paris, the other goals of the Paris Agreement, really depend on two levers. One is the technological evolution. How do we invest in our research and development and make sure that those technologies that are necessary can scale up rapidly, become more cost effective, and can therefore be you know, a, a, an interesting investment option and technological solution for those challenges at large scale. And the second thing is, as McKinsey very you know, well puts in its report, the fact that we will probably need to rethink fundamentally public policy in, the, in, in which those investments are operating around taxation, subsidies, uh, probably carbon pricing, as well as the availability of public funding to scale up some of those technologies. Uh, all those policies you know, that need to alter and modify the current risk return equation, which makes those investments not uh, you know, currently having a standalone investment case. Therefore, uh, one of our recommendations that we'll show in the report later on is that investment investors should really think more actively about starting to engage with policymakers on climate policies and other policies to explain much more in a much more structured and consistent way and systematic way to policymakers that those policies are not only about you know, changing the real economy, but they also alter the risk return equation and therefore alter the way certain sectors or technologies become attractive for private capital, which is ultimately, as Will said, you know, one of the state policy goals. How do we reorient capital flows to the types of investment we need to meet sustainability challenges? <coughs> and further on, then in the report, looking at investor impact and what we saw as levers, the question then became, well, how, how does the notion of investor impact feature currently in the EU sustainable finance agenda. Uh, why the EU sustainable finance agenda? Clearly, because I think it's beyond doubt that the EU has taken a big step a couple of years ago to be a leader in this space and to uh, have the first, if you want, take the first steps to enact concrete policies and regulations to steer private finance toward meeting those sustainability goals. So therefore, it was obviously the most developed regulatory framework around the world, and therefore the most interesting to analyze also for us from a Eurosef perspective, obviously, on does investor impact feature prominently at this stage in the EU sustainable finance agenda. And what we see, first of all, is the question of how does then you know, engagement and stewardship feature in this agenda right now? And what we see is that, uh, if we're fair and honest, uh, the engagement and stewardship role of investors at this stage has not featured very prominently in the action plan on sustainable finance from 2018 and the regulatory agenda at this stage. And clearly for us, uh, looking at that, looking at how engagement if done well can be a very powerful tool to orchestrate change, uh, we think that it probably warrants a re-examining of the different frameworks across the EU, uh, whether it be the shareholder rights directive, whether it be uh, things like the SFDR provisions on engagement, probably we need to have a more holistic, you know, rethink of some of those 
and to make them much more uh, precise uh, and actually reflect best practices in the industry uh, on the wider scale. Um, second thing is, does the sustainable financial agenda at this stage contain really measures to channel capital towards more impactful and capital constrained companies and projects? I think as we've highlighted in the report extensively, um, this is both a question of can investors change their capital allocation, but also uh, are there investment opportunities out there uh, that investors could seize that would help more uh, towards meeting those sustainability goals? And as a you know, recent report by the European Court of Auditors explained quite cogently, uh, the sustainable finance agenda up to now has been very much focused on bringing more transparency to the financial system. However, it's not yet at the stage where uh, it really is looking at pricing sustainability. Pricing sustainability that means pricing negative externalities, making potentially over time less sustainable investments less attractive and sustainable investments more attractive from a risk return equation. Uh, and that's where uh, potentially engaging on the uh, climate policy on the EU uh, you know, climate agenda and the Fit for 55 package currently on discussion is essential for investors to really complement transparency with much more, you know, uh, uh, policies driving at the pricing of those assets. Finally, are current regulations helping to convey, helping investors to convey market signals? I think as Will uh, also in his introductory remark quite cogently put it, uh, it's clear that the rollout of the sustainable finance agenda is uh, facing some complexities, some challenges. Uh, we are now seeing with, you know, uh, both the SFDR regulation, which applied as of March. Um, we're seeing that there is uh, potentially fragmentation in the market, different understandings, different interpretation of the legislation, different notions about what we consider sustainable investments. And as a result, that, in our view, potentially waters down also the signals that can be sent to companies. Similarly, for uh, the EU taxonomy, uh, at this stage, uh, all data studies show that it covers uh, only a, a, a very limited part of the European economy, uh, a number of sectors, and the question begs of how strong can the market signals be towards those companies uh, if it covers only a very limited slice of the economy at this stage. So bearing all that in mind, uh, we obviously uh, in, in here really, you know, being wanting to remain humble uh, because uh, we fully acknowledge these are very complex issues uh, and these are complex and fast evolving issues. Uh, and and, and you know, we don't think any association or group will have necessarily all the answers to those challenges by themselves. But we uh, looked at that and we uh, tried to articulate a number of recommendations to policymakers on what we think may be, you know, maybe ways of putting this notion of investor impact more strongly at the center of the EU sustainable finance agenda. And here, uh, for us, it's very clear, uh, we will need to, in the future, rethink and strength from the frameworks around stewardship and engagement by, share, by investors and shareholders to ensure that it's much more outcomes focused and there's much more objectives and that uh, the actions undertaken align with objectives that uh, align with scientific evidence and therefore also you know, allow, uh, for example, concretely investors to have a much more uh, focused engagement on transition plans by companies. Second thing is at European level, we really see the need to rethink more broadly how to leverage public finance to de-risk some of the investments necessary to climate transition. For example, through much more uptake uh, of blended finance, uh, be it with through the different EU programs, but also uh, you know, at the level of EU member states themselves. How do we ensure that we can smartly uh, leverage the uh, a public balance sheet or public purse in a way uh, to uh, in multiply uh, the flow of private capital to the investments that are necessary. 
part of that equation, as we uh, have said before, is where possible policies pricing negative externalities, uh, vehicle climate and environment and social externalities are really important to send very sig direct signals to the bottom line, uh, you know, uh, profitability or business case for certain investments, which ultimately are still one of the most powerful drivers of capital allocation by investors. Furthermore, uh, for us, it's increasingly clear that we will need to probably rethink uh, the application of the SFDR to make sure that uh, we get more clarity and more consistency across Europe on the different SRI products and strategies out there, but also that we understand much more clearly um, and, and, and reach a much more uh, coherent consensus, consensus view on what sustainable investments are and, and, and wh wh where do we want to drive uh, capital in the future. We will also need to streamline the EU taxonomy uh, further uh, so that it becomes really a tool to reorient capital. Uh, that will mean uh, you know, having great clarity on what activities are green, what activities are transition activities, uh, what types of energy sources are, are transition activities, and also uh, make sure that uh, the taxonomy remains really usable for investors and does not become too complex and therefore uh, you know, risks becoming a tick the box exercise rather than a meaningful tool uh, to help investors understand in the future where uh, they could allocate their capital. And finally, uh, we are absolutely convinced that the you know one of the missing pieces of the agenda to now and sustainable finance agenda has been uh, you know more consistent and standardized reporting rules for uh, investee companies uh, so that they uh, provide the data information that invest that enable investors to hopefully take better investment decisions taking into account sustainability but as part of that for us it remains very critical uh, that this new legislation uh, also focuses on uh, the net zero pledges by companies and financial institutions and make sure that those net zero pledges are uh, stacked up with science and, and, and you know, do, do make sense from a scientific perspective um, and hopefully you know, trigger the, uh, the need for companies to have uh, clear transition plans and also in those transition plans that clearly identify their capital needs for the future, which type of capital, uh, for which financing mechanism, and from there for which financial institutions. And finally, our report also contains a number of recommendations, we believe, to investors, again, you know, uh, trying to make the debate evolve. Um, again, we believe that there's a lot of ground to be made and won in the sophistication and effectiveness of uh, engagement engagement and stewardship activities. Um, we would also encourage, uh, for example, investors to look at the tools of the EU sustainable finance agenda through that lens. We believe that, you know, probably with some adaptation, but that the EU taxonomy, for example, and potentially the you know, Paris line benchmark already existing could be very useful tools to map out and plan uh, an engagement strategy with investee companies. For example, how would investee companies plan to at some point expand and meet the you know the objectives of the EU taxonomy could be a very interesting way of setting objectives in your engagement strategy going forward. As we said as well in the report, um, we strongly believe that investors need to become a bigger voice on public policy uh, towards policymakers on climate and other public policies that are impacting uh, those sectors where we need investments. Um, that means getting more active on the EU Green Deal, for example, on the recently adopted Fit for 55 package, which is you know, a package of legislation seeking to translate the uh, commitments of the EU climate law into you know, concrete uh, sectoral roadmaps, uh, changing the sectors of the economy where, you know, for those sectors whose transition is vital to whether we achieve or not the uh, uh, objective of the Paris Agreement. And finally, to really consider much for investors to consider much more how they can enhance the investor impact in their capital allocation decisions. And to give you a concrete example, um, you know, what, what, what's becoming apparent from different publications of the, the IAGCC or the IEA this year is uh, whether we meet the uh, climate goals globally uh, to a large degree 
will really depend just because of the sheer scale and size of the challenge will very much depend on which direction uh, Asia in the future goes to meet its further energy and electrification needs. Uh, will there be will, will the this those new needs be met by fossil fuels or will it be met by a massive expansion of renewable energy? Uh, those are the thematics where we think investors can clearly think in their capital allocation decisions. How can I really contribute to uh, you know to the to, to, to meet to putting the money where it will have the biggest impact? And finally, as we said, uh, clearly much closer collaboration with public actors. Uh, and, and public, uh, you know, and governments to clearly map out where uh, investments can happen currently, but where, unfortunately, you know, public funding is necessary to de-risk those. These are some of the snapshots of this year's report. Uh, obviously, I encourage you all to read in much more detail the report uh, and get in touch with us you know, if you have any questions. Again, you know, to echoing uh, Will's word, uh, want I want to thank our gracious sponsors who enabled us to do this piece of research and work. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the Eurosif team for its uh, you know, tireless uh, commitment to delivering this report together with our members. And in particular, thanks to uh, Kyoko Sakumakek for leading this work and, uh, and making sure that this uh, report could be produced. Uh, and without further ado, I will now uh, you know, pass on to uh, the moderator for our First panel, uh, Elsa from Responsible Investor. Uh, Elsa, the, the floor will be yours. Thank you so much, uh, Victor. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to this panel session uh, hosted by Eurosif. Um, I'm Elsa Homset Pell, and I'm the Deputy Editor for Responsible Investor. The topic we're tackling today is how investors can make an impact and really encourage companies to uh, towards the transition path. It's a very interesting time for a debate on this, especially given the shift in sustainable investment, investment to focus at least primarily on managing risks towards uh, focusing on making an impact. This is seen in investor strategies um, as well in, in the raft of regulation being rolled out on sustainable finance at the moment, particularly, I suppose, in the EU but also elsewhere. Um, on the flip side, we're of course also seeing that things aren't happening fast enough and to a great enough extent. And investors are, for example, uh, voice, increasingly voicing their frustrations uh, about not being able to make big enough impacts, for example, through their shareholder engagement initiatives. So how are investors making an impact today? And uh, what can they do to further encourage the transition? And what do they really need in order to do so? We'll discuss today how investors can have a positive real-world impact through the companies they invest in, through a number of mechanisms. We'll also be honing in on shareholder engagement as one such mechanism and discuss its advantages, uh, its drawbacks, and also um, highlight some real-world sort of practical examples of successful engagements. To help do this, I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers. We're joined by Lucy Pinson, founder and executive director of Reclaim Finance and Sean Kidney, founder and executive director of the Climate Bonds Initiative, as well as Robin Brown, senior business manager for responsible investment at uh, DWS Group. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think we'll start with you, Robin, to really kick off with the investor point of view. Can I ask you to talk about the engagement strategy you've got at uh, DWS and give us an idea of how you really encourage companies uh, towards the trans transition path? Yes, thank you, Elsa, and also thanks to the uh, to the organizers of Eurosif to hosting this interesting panel, and of course for issuing this highly relevant and interesting uh, Eurosif report 2021 with that very prominent topic. So engagement and of course active ownership in general is not something that DWS Group, as a globally operating asset manager, has introduced recently. This has been part of our fiduciary duty dating back to the uh, to the mid 1990s um, but of course this has evolved um, also with increasing uh, regulatory developments with increasing data coverage also from ESG um, data vendors of course the opportunities for asset managers have increased but as Victor has already stated also the complexity has increased engagement um, 
with investee companies is a highly labor intensive and a, a complex topic and the bigger you grow as an asset manager the more intensive it gets but of course our active ownership is of course driven by our fiduciary duty and it's of course underpinned by academic research that engagement with investee companies pays off both from a shareholder perspective from a bondholder perspective but of course also for improving sustainability outcomes um, we transparently outline the engagement approach that we take um, in our active ownership report, we have done so in the past as well, but we also acknowledge um, we may need to improve this in the, in the near term future and need to be more concentrated, more focused. Uh, also, as Victor has pointed out on the, um, on the impact side of things or also on achieving sustainability targets and sustainability outcomes. Now, the shareholder engagement piece that usually takes place by our proxy voting mechanism by participating in annual general meetings by um, sending our investee companies pre-season letters on our corporate governance expectations or on sustainability expectations in general and then of course following up with bilateral um, discussions with our investee companies in cases where DWS um, took a particular voting decision. Now there might also be um, exceptional cases where we do thematic engagement letters with company with bilateral follow-up um, discussions, in particular related to DWS's um, net zero pledge that we took in, um, in December 2020. Um, Nick has also, uh, uh, Victor has also kindly um, um, already referred to that, um, that the near net zero pledges of the investee companies that we take um, should also be um, stacked up by science. That's also something that we demand with our investee companies. But of course, um, um, there needs to be a certain type of escalation mechanism out there. Uh, we, uh, we, we take those via our ownership role, uh, um, our ownership rights and by voting accordingly if the companies um, don't um, act on our expectations on um, on sustainability. Um, that is a bit in a nutshell what we, uh, what we do. Uh, on the regulatory side, we are quite happy that um, also SFDR and the sustainability, um, Sustainable Finance Action Plan also introduced some, some new tools that we can work with. For example, the concept of principal adverse impacts or the concept of double materiality is something that we can very well introduce um, into our engagement process. Um, of course, all under the assumption that um, data availability is there. Data on sustainability of companies is, of course, um, uh, is, is of course the, the, the overarching principle. We need to have reliable data. Uh, we subscribe to various um, vendors of ESG data. We don't criticize that ESG data vendors don't always agree. We acknowledge it and we use it um, as a strength to have a 360 degree picture of strengths and weaknesses of investee companies and use those for our engagement dialogues. And of course, we follow up with very regular um, meetings to check if the KPIs that we have set for the companies are fulfilled, whether they are met or whether they need to be um, set more ambitiously. That is a bit in a, in a nutshell what we do, uh, of course, on a global um, operating on a global base of investee companies. Uh, we are talking about thousands of companies that we could theoretically engage in. Um, we exercise our proxy votes where we can, but of course the bilateral one-on-one -on -one engagement that is done on a focused list um, of, of uh, a couple of hundred companies. We may choose to engage or strategically engage uh, with uh, with a selected group of companies where we really want to define sustainability outcomes also as defined by the principle, principles for responsible investments. Another tool that helps us very well tie those to the sustainable development goals and really try to find out progress. A bit from my side. Great. Thank you so much, Robin, for kicking off. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your relationship with uh, index providers and how that works in your sort of engagement process? That's a very good uh, point, Elsa. So when I talked about the, the escalation mechanisms, um, I'm sure maybe later on we will come to the point on whether the ultimate escalation should be to divest uh, from your holdings. Um, now for DWS, um, also being active in, in offering exchange-traded funds, 
that only can take place to a very limited extent when we deal with our holdings uh, in exchange traded funds. So there, um, the overarching principle is to minimize the tracking error for the for the investees, uh, for our for our investors. Um, so therefore, selling NVST companies would have an impact on that. So, but of course, the uh, option that we still have, uh, and one of those initiatives was founded in 2018, I believe, when, when there was an, an engagement with index providers on potentially excluding controversial weapons. That is something we will intensify in the future and have an engagement plan for our teams within our passive investment management uh, division to really at least annually engage with one index provider to embed sustainability risks in their index construction, to report very transparently on what is in those indices and really set them standards of what we think should be an index and what should rather not be in an index. So we really try to um, take, the, take the perspective from there that we primarily speak with the index providers and try to um, exert our, our, our influence on that side. The WS is quite a sizable uh, player in the, in the ETF space. And of course, we have many partners in the index provider space, but of course, we, we should articulate our views on sustainability also with, with those participants in the market. Thank you. That's really interesting, the role of yeah, talking to index providers and engaging with them um, and, and that, that part of sort of reaching net zero, I can imagine it's, it's quite useful to hear for, for other players that are very active in ETFs and passive investment. Um, and finally, before we move on to the next speaker, um, could you talk to me about any specific examples you've got of uh, successful engagement and uh, more challenging ones? And I suppose really how you think uh, when you hit uh, something that's more challenging. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Um, one successful example that quickly comes to my mind is an engagement or a focused engagement that we had in the context with our Climate Action 100 plus uh, participation. Um, there we are dealing with uh, one of the supposed high carbon emitters, that's a, a utilities companies, a company. And there we started already with our very first um, request towards the company to appoint an independent director with sufficient climate expertise to actually oversee climate related risks and um, act accordingly in the context of um, his or her function. Um, another one was, of course, setting ambitious targets regarding scope one, two and three. Um, the third one is, of course, um, also looking at the downstream scope three emissions from using the company's products. And one thing that we are currently um, dealing with is, um, is of course, that the company um, actually broadens their scope on scenario analysis uh, related to climate and not only focusing it on few specific markets, but taking a global approach to that. We are in the, we're in the progress of that. Um, I, in the beginning, I highlighted that we um, transparently report on any progress that we do with our investee companies in the active ownership. But of course, Elsa, you are right that, of course, there are challenging examples. One of them is generally from the um, rather emerging market space, um, where the information availability is, is not as great as we have for developed markets. It becomes particularly challenging when we are dealing with partly state-owned or state-owned um, companies, because their progress is ultimately depending on what the sovereign um, owner of that company um, is, is doing. And... Um, the, the respective countries' um, climate plans. For an asset manager, it's quite um, difficult to engage with, um, with, uh, with, with employees of the state. Um, so therefore trying to get access to government officials is difficult. Another example is whenever we do engagement on sustainability controversies that we and also the ESG data vendors are um, calling them structural, a structural controversy might be something that a company would have to close down an entire um, business business branch or division in order to get rid of this um, controversy. One example would be, for example, being involved in controversial weapons. Um, so that is, unfortunately, a black and white uh, decision of the company to be involved in that or whether to divest or to continue with that. And that, of course, depends then on the asset managers um, sustainability principles but of course in all 
respects, we do our best as possible to stay engaged and to speak with the companies as well. Great, thank you very much, Robin. Um, and moving to you, Lucy, could you pick up on the point on, you know, what should happen when engagement is challenging or maybe doesn't work? And uh, how long can investors really work on engaging before they have to consider other options? Sure, thanks for that. Um, that's a very great question because we tend to oppose um, engagement to divestment and we clearly believe that uh, Reclaim Finance at both needs to work together to have an impact on, on companies. Obviously, the big question is what truly to investment to or to divestment and what are the conditions to maintain uh, investment in a particular companies and keep engaging with these companies. So we do believe that it's really important to have a very clear framework with very clear demands to be made by, by clear deadlines with a clear intensification process so that companies could exactly know what is expected from them, for, from the investors. And we believe this transparency and this clarity is um, conditional to the quality of the conditions, the quality of the dialogue that can take place. So obviously, when, when today we, we can see a lot of investors are willing to, to engage, but there is a, this don't have necessarily the clear policy with the clear criteria in place. So they might also be, it might be difficult for them when it comes to voting practices or um, engagement uh, at the end of the year if they want to decide if they stay in or out. It might be difficult actually to take a decision because there will always be progress made by a company on specific criteria and without a clear framework with uh, clear red lines. It might be difficult to say is this progress enough to actually respond to the climate emergency. So we believe there is an importance to have a it's important to have a clear framework with uh, clear engagement items because there are a lot of things that we, if you that we need to engage companies on. For example, with oil and gas company, you might engage with them on the adoption of short-term, medium-term, and long-term uh, decarbonization targets. You might engage them with on um, about uh, the lobbying practices, the integration of climate criteria in the um, remuneration policy. Uh, you might engage with them on the reliance on offset and CCS, many, many items of discussion. And Fortunately, they and also on green capex. And fortunately, they will have progress made by the companies on some of these criteria. Um, however, um, it's uh, very important, we believe, to have shorter and, and stricter criteria, a shorter list of criteria to influence the way investors will uh, vote, for example, at AGM, how would they position themselves in regards to say on climate, because we can see that say on climate are going to be like a, a growing trend and that investors will face a lot of sound climate in the future and say we'll need to have these very clear criteria if they want to be in capacity to just process their decision internally because they won't have the staff to, to respond to that. And we believe that should make a shorter list for deciding what should uh, influence or vote in um, for or against. And finally, if there is no sound climate or uh, uh, but they still need to take a position in regards to voting uh, on the uh, approbation of uh, general accounts or the renewal of board members um, or at the end of the year if they want to consider if they keep in, engaging with the company or divest, here there should be like even stricter red lines um, and, and one maybe criteria which we believe is the most important one uh, because this success conditions uh, all other measures, the quality of all other measures that we could push at companies level, which is the end of oil and gas expansion. The IEA this year has made be has made very clear that we can't open new fossil fuel projects and that if a company is uh, still developing new coal plants or new coal mines or oil and opening new oil and gas fields, these companies clearly not in transition and that should condition um, the voting practices of an investor of or at the end of the year, if the investors stay in or, or out. Um, so it will be very important to have clear deadlines in regards to, to this specific uh, criteria. Um, we do believe that it's important, like in addition to have uh, the um, the overall framework to make divestments also systematic for all companies with the same profile. 
uh, others are failing to meet one very clear demand. We believe it's important because uh, first it will send a signal to the industry but what is required from them to, to stay uh, in the portfolio of the investors and what steps they need to take uh, as a first step to, to stay in. And it could also, this kind of policy could also uh, influence other financial institutions beyond investors to actually adopt the same criteria. And obviously uh, the purpose of, uh, of this is to have uh, similar joint demands or red, line, joint red lines to be put on the table by investors in order to really influence the way a company will be um, transitioning. Um, and we do believe that if they do that, actually we will avoid having uh, a useless exclusion, but that actually uh, in case there is a divestment, uh, it could be actually very impactful if, there is, if it's joined by uh, a group of, uh, of investors. Great, thank you, Lucy. Um, I want to pick up on your point on, say, on climate, because um, that's really interesting. First of all, could you just explain what it is in case anyone is listening is not familiar with the Say on Climate um, sort of initiative? Um, and can you also just talk a little bit about how impactful you think it's been to date, I suppose? Yeah, um, so the Say on Climate basically uh, intends to ask companies to, I mean, to incentive companies to ask their shareholders about uh, the position on the climate strategy of the of the company. Uh, so we got, for example, last year, we got Vinci in France, we got Total, we got Shell as well, um, consulting their shareholders uh, for an opinion vote on the climate strategy. Uh, so it gives an opportunity to the shareholders to say yes or no in regards to, to the to the to the sell, to the climate strategy of a company. Um, the big issue in regards to that is that um, uh, many investors uh, don't have a clear framework about how they will position themselves in regards to a sound climate. So last year, considering it was the first time we got few of them, a lot of them were considering, a lot of investors were considering uh, that just to have a, a vote, uh, a say on climate be filed was a sign of progress, a sign of the will of the company to to dialogue and to open the, uh, um, to get an opinion from, from the shareholder and it was enough to actually assess progress. However, we do believe that's a very uh, strange way to assess pro progress considering uh, climate change will not be uh, solved through only discussion, it will be solved through uh, the implementation of strong uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction targets and that the position of investors should be influenced only uh, by the content of uh, a sound climate. So it should be very important already now for investors to anticipate the fact that uh, companies tomorrow will uh, do more and more uh, say on climate, which could eventually become like um, um, uh, obligatory in, in some countries uh, as a say on paid, it uh, become um, uh, compulsory. And they should anticipate that to actually indicate to the companies uh, what they do expect to find in the climate strategy of a company to actually support or not a specific uh, say on climate. And obviously it raises a lot of, of questions, like for example, in, in France, you have a regulatory framework where um, it's unclear if uh, there is a, a, a space for investors to actually take a position on the climate strategy of their investee, uh, investee companies. And for sure, uh, investors can't force companies that they are investing in to follow a specific trajectory. But in regards to the law right now, we do believe that there is a, a clear space for investors to ask information that are required to assess the exposure of their investing companies to climate risk and um, and to us to have the information uh, assessing the gap between the climate strategy or the trajectory of uh, the investing companies and a 1.5 trajectory for example so it's more like a right for information than rights uh, to uh, by the company to follow a specific um, a specific uh, path. Um, so this type of regulatory um, issue is one of the many issues that are today slowing down uh, the uh, engagement. Uh, we do believe also that um, uh, engagement uh, is 
needs to be very uh, it, it needs to be dedicated to few uh, a few numbers of companies. Uh, realistically, we can't engage, we can't expect investors to engage with all the companies in their portfolio. And so that's why also it's really important to consider what kind of companies are actually fit for transitioning and for engagement and what kind of companies are not even willing to transition. And they sh we believe investors should not spend their time trying to convince a company which has a huge capex in the fossil fuel sector and which is showing on a daily basis that they don't really care about the transition. Because just from a very realistic point of view, an investors don't have the staff to actually engage effectively with all the companies of its its portfolio. So there needs to be like a, a very clear um division uh, between between the two and and another uh, big hurdle to uh, engagement today is a conflict of interest uh, we do have uh, some investors that have much pace for engaging companies that are far away um, geographically speaking uh, if you're a french investor to engage with the french companies might be difficult because the boards are actually linked with together together so you do or, or you do have your um, banking branch which is actually providing and beneficiating uh, from contracts with the companies that you are engaging. So uh, the argument that we hear a lot about the wall of China, actually, we, we, we can see it on a daily basis that it's, it's not working. It's not true. And that some investors will be much more progressive with companies that are far away and with win, which they don't have um, conflict of, a, of, a, of interest. So, so that's kind of a thing that needs to be addressed today if we really want to make engagement uh, work for the transition. Thank you so much, uh, Lucy. Um, and just before I move to Sean, I want to remind everyone who's listening, please ask questions. I see we're getting a couple of questions in already, uh, but definitely uh, put your, your questions on, on this to our expert speakers um, today. Um, so, Sean, um, coming to you last, but definitely not least, um, could you help sort of really give us the big picture view here? on how investors are making an impact and, and, and perhaps pick up on some of the points that Lucy and, um, and Robin um, have made and um, also explain what the limitations are, I suppose, of these kinds of engagements, activities uh, in the context of the wider financial system. Well, look, they're all good points. And the fact that we're now beginning to see more investor engagement is great. I, I do think we can do a lot more on the fixed income side engagement. I would probably say to Robin, I think we can do more even as ETF investors. There is scope for us to be visible and there is scope for us to be loud at the minimum. And I look at GIPF, which is the um, pension fund of Japan, the largest pension fund of the world, who is, by act of parliament is not allowed to divest. How effective they've been with their lobbying around the importance of engagement, even with, within a portfolio where they have very limited action they can take. And in their case, it's been influencing fund managers. And they've, they've played the contracts for passive investing in such a way as they've pushed their fund managers to become active on their behalf, notably BlackRock and State Street Global. And that's the origins of some of the letters that you've seen coming through from Larry Fink. So I think the scope for us to do things, it's more challenging, clearly. But I, I want to say that engagement on change and individual enterprises important as it is, and I pick up Lucy's points about focus, you know, focus is really critical. Um, risks being shuffling the deck chairs and the Titanic while the Titanic heads to an iceberg. And the way the society goes, let's call it the enabling envelope for the investments that are made by individual companies and by investors, um, is the thing we have to focus on here. You know, we are currently heading into extreme change. We are going to have very severe, non-linear, abrupt changes in this century akin to the pandemic again and again and again. That's the nature of climate change. It isn't a lovely warming bath. <laughs> it is actually something that becomes very volatile. And that volatility is hard to predict because that's the nature of volatility and it will severely impact on economies. I mean, look what the heat dome in British Columbia earlier this year where we saw 50 degrees Celsius days in a cold place, for goodness sakes. 
and so on. So that's just a taste of the kinds of things we'll see and the impact. We need to be making sure that the capital of the Titanic is changing direction, which means the role of investors here, apart from working on the engagement of individual enterprises, has got to be to at least band together to work to ensure that the public sector is adopting policies that are adequate to what we're trying to deal with here. You know, the ability of DWS to get returns to pay back us over the time will depend on the extent to which the European and the global economy, this is a global problem, let's be very clear about that, shifts in the right direction. If it doesn't, it does not matter what Robin does. The Institute of Actuaries in a report five years ago said that on current trajectories of climate change, we expect to see wholesale decimation of portfolios by 2050 because of the impacts of extreme volatility. That's really what we're facing, and that's the biggest job. Now, we've seen some coming together of investor coalitions, the Climate Action 100 Plus, and so on, which is fantastic, which is really good. But it does need to be a focus on how we bolster the opportunities for rapid change. What someone like Coca-Cola does, trying to get out of plastics, is really useful. But what we do with the regulatory environment is more important and more urgent. Uh, I'm not saying one or the other, by the way. I'm saying we need both. But that, that's really where we need to be start thinking about now. The taxonomy is useful, et cetera, et cetera. I know I'm one of the architects of that. Of course, I'm going to say that. It's useful because it provides a shopping list for what we need to do rather than necessarily, from my point of view, the specific detailed impact on financial sector actors, albeit that's how most people would experience it. And what we have failed to do in the last 30 years is to be clear about what it is we have to do. We have generally said, oh, that sounds really bad. What about we just do this? Is that okay? And that's the National Climate Change Plan. I mean, essentially, we have failed drastically, enormously, in developing appropriate responses to the challenge that our scientists have said before us. So the Climate Change Plan, except for the odd little problem, the Commission is being forced by member states to consider bringing gas into it at the moment, despite the explicit, clear and uh, unarguable advice of the International Energy Agency that gas is not consistent with a 1.5 degree trajectory. So the fight between member states and the commission is what we need to watch. Investors could be actively involved in pushing member states. Germany is a problem, folks. DWS, you've got a German side. What are you doing in Berlin to make sure that the German government, especially the incoming one, understands the issues at stake here, for example? And I'd say that to all investors, to Allianz as well. Um, so they're, they're the issues for me that are really important now. And of course, we also need to be looking at the proactive investments that governments can make. Now, I, I don't want to say, you know, you must do this, finger waving is never going to work for any public sector. We need to focus on the opportunities here. And there are significant opportunities. A large investment in green hydrogen, what Thierry Le Perc in Paris is doing, for example, is a fantastic direction for the European economy. But there are some big, bold things we're going to have to do to try and address the linear impacts that are about to hit us sideways. We need to be thinking about a bad bank for fossil fuel assets. All European fossil fuel assets should be dumped in a bad bank, taken off the balance sheets of others, and dealt with as an asset pool that we are winding down. We need to be looking at a buyout fund for all fisheries in Europe, the world, frankly. $3 billion is all we'd need in the calculations I've seen to buy out the fishing stock of the world and put them on a pension and let the oceans recover. Of course, we will need to look at food stocks for people, I understand all of that. So urban farming, if we have a dramatic increase in licensing and then support for urban farming to free up land for biodiversity recovery, that is a substantial measure that we can do. I mean, simple things that we've been talking about for 10 years. If we rapidly ramp up the European grid, the energy vendor in Germany, for example, to allow proper sharing of energy, renewable energy around Europe, we reduce the need for fossil fuels. So these are things that we've got to start tackling. These are things that investors can be saying to governments, hey, if you do this and find a way for us to invest, we want to invest because we want to be part of the transition. Let's get active. Thanks so much, Sean, for, for that. And uh, bringing it back to the investor, then, are you seeing any investors doing this uh, in at any kind of scale, you know, uh, talking to member states, 
uh, so in the EU or talking to um, governments in whatever country they're based. Um, and yeah, does it work? Well, uh, you know, with the odd potential exception, Allianz in Germany, um, mm -hmm. it uh, is unlikely to work because no single investor has enough heft in its own right. Maybe NBIM in, in Norway, but NBIM is a creature of the central bank, so they're not going to be able to do it. Um, but banding together, we can do it. So I'll answer that question positively by saying I've had some very positive discussions, both with CIOs and fixed income teams in some of the largest investors in the world in the past six months about it being time to do this. So I do think the appetite is growing. I think what we need now, you know, and that's kind of going to come down to people like Lucy and myself, is laying out an agenda and starting to organise people together to do this sort of stuff. But individual investors, well, let's face it, there are very few individual investors who have any chance of being able to make an impact by themselves. But you band together. Institutional investors own everything. Let's be clear about that, you know. They own everything. They need to be understanding the stewardship aspects of having that ownership responsibility and how to change their potential to get a reasonable and sustainable income from that ownership responsibility. And getting a sustainable income to pay our pensions, I want my pension paid eventually when I finally retire, is about changing the economic environment in which we operate. It's not just about changing the individual debt card in a pack of cards that we have. Thank you, Sean. I, you'll never retire, I don't think, not from this, uh, not from this fight. Um, Great, thank you so much. And you mentioned um, the taxonomy and EU policy, which you know we won't. I wanted to put this to the other speakers as well. We won't go sort of too much in depth on this because I know there are two other panels later today that they will indeed do so. But sort of very briefly, Rob, Robin, um, what are your thoughts here? You know, do investors have the right frameworks and regulation in place, and are you encouraged by what's going on in the EU at the moment? You mentioned before, I think, um, principal adverse impact and the push in the EU to really address uh, double materiality. I mean, that should help encourage, you know, impact being created, right? Or, or what were your thoughts on this? No, absolutely, uh, Elsa, and thanks for, for picking that up again. So, of course, um, taxonomy is at the moment um, uh, a big word that everybody is working on and of course it goes into the right um, direction looking at uh, revenues capital expenditures and operating expenditures but of course it will take significant amounts of um, of time until this reporting really unfolds then in a reliable way um, from the companies to the market and of course ultimately um, to the asset managers at the moment um, Many financial market participants are dealing with um, approximations or with estimations also based on the sustainable development goals. That is good, but that means that we will still be facing a transition phase under which, uh, until which um, the companies which would report under the CSRD in the future can reliably um, and transparently um, report taxonomy relevant economic activities. So that might take still until 2024 and 2025. Until then, we will live in the transition phase. The principal adverse impact concept is indeed a good one. We observed, uh, we observed that the data coverage, depending on uh, which ESG data vendor um, the financial market participant subscribes to, um, is, is, is fair, if not even good or very good. Um, that's something we can, we can work with. And, uh, we're curious to see on what um, the financial market participants' principal adverse impact statements will start to look like uh, in 2023 and when they will be first uh, reported. So the level two RTS have been further revised last week. Uh, we expect them to all come into force in July 2022 and then the calculation period um, starts. So we will be curious to see how that will look like on an aggregate basis. But like I mentioned before, principal adverse impacts, double materiality is of course something which should already be embedded in um, asset managers' mindsets um, and that you don't only start looking at the, at the financial materiality and the role that sustainability risks play towards the company, but that you also look what is the impact of your investee firm on environment and society 
that is something which is crucial to look at because um, the, the stock price performance is not the only thing um, that matters. You have to consider both um, at the same time. So the tool set um, is there. We, we have uh, good data available. Um, Sean also mentioned certain types of collaborative engagements. Climate Action 100 Plus is a, is a very good example. Um, but one thing um, that is still hindering us, at least in Germany, um, is currently um, the, the interpretation of the German um, supervisory authority regarding acting in concert. So um, that unfortunately obstructs certain asset managers to becoming more active in a, a concentrated way with, for example, campaign groups such as Share Action. Um, other asset managers can participate from other, from other countries because the interpretation might be a little bit a different one. Um, at the moment, um, at least German asset managers are a little bit, um, a little bit um, hindered by this, by this interpretation. Of course, what we can still do is, of course, engaging with, uh, with government of fit officials. Um, Sean, also to your point, one management board, board member of um, TWS is active in the Sustainable Finance Advisory Board to the German Ministry. So that is a good thing. Um, so we can we can um, advise um, policymakers on that and take some directions on that. But of course, for us, what's what's key is is having the right reporting from the companies in order to to act. So those are the tools that we have available. Um, they can improve, but for the moment, we have sufficient tools. Thanks a lot, Robin and and Lucy. Any sort of quick thoughts on uh, on regulation in the in the EU, I suppose, particularly, um, and how it's helping potentially to drive impact? Yeah, sure. Um, first, let me to maybe just comment a little bit on what Robin has said. And um, double materiality has become uh, like such a big a buzzy word that everybody is uh, talking about. Like we are. Uh, talking about transition, transformative action, climate challenge. Now we are talking about double, double materiality, but to be completely honest, right now, um, investors and financial institutions are mostly focusing on still a, a risk uh, approach. They are still trying to get uh, away from climate change and make sure that they are not impacted too much in the short term, instead of really preventing their own impact on climate change. Uh, we can see that just having a look at the quality of policies adopted by financial institutions on call, um, we do have more than 270 financial institutions uh, having poor call policy worldwide, but only 25 of them are good enough to actually prevent the expansion of the coal sector. So we believe that if an investor such as DWS, which doesn't have any coal policy at all, and that other investors that do have a coal policy but still invest in companies that are actively building new coal plants in 2021, are clearly not going into a transition phase and that in finally investing them it's clearly having um, a, a very bad impact on climate change and that's a, an impactful approach um, should uh, mean divesting from from these companies in order to focus on the other companies that might be exposed to the coal sector but don't have any expansion plans and should be pushed to adopt an asset-based coal phase out uh, plan Regarding to the to the regulation, um, obviously it's quite. Uh, I mean, all the disclosure requirements are are, are welcome, but as uh, Robin has said, they won't provide any um, effective uh, impact before 2024, if we are lucky. Uh, considering financial institutions will rely on companies' disclosure, and we all know that the reporting is uh, will be the first one, so that it will be insufficient. Uh, data might be not harmonized enough and we might still think oh it's not good enough we need more data we need no more data so we think indeed it's it's good to work on this uh, on this side but on the other hand it's really important to already to not postpone action because we actually know enough right now and we actually have enough data right now to take action in order to prevent um not maybe to do like the full transition but at least to stop worsening the situation by supporting companies that are adding more and more fossil goods fossil fuels um or projects uh, online as sean said the iea has made very clear that no new 
and fossil fuel projects should be production fields should be should be developed. And and fortunately, we do already have data in regards to which company are, pro, uh, um, are developing uh, new fossil fuel projects. Uh, the NGO Urgeval has produced the global code exit list, which is providing this type of information for the core sector. And the global code exit list is today used by more than 700 financial institutions, including big financial institutions such as AXA, which are using it to actually assess their exposure to the core sector and guide their exclusion policy or engagement policy as well. So, and, and today we will have like on the 4th of November, so very soon, uh, the global oil and gas exit list that will be published and will provide this type of information about which companies are expanding the most in the upstream oil and gas sectors, which one are developing in some of the riskier sectors such as non-conventional fossil fuels, etc. and etc. And that provide key tools for financial institutions to already work on to take uh, action. Because when it comes maybe one last thing about the taxonomy, when it comes about um, an impact, double materiality, and preventing the impact of financial institutions on the climate, the green taxonomy, if it's finally credible, if it becomes a credible tool, which still remains to be seen because it's not finalized yet and we might end up with having gas in it, uh, so it will be completely uh, decredibilized. Um, it's a good, if it's credi credible, it will be a good tool for driving uh, investment in, in the solutions. However, we will still missing a taxonomy for polluting activities and that will require time as well. So we need to work on this tool, but we all already need to acknowledge the emergency of the situation and work on available data to stop worsening the situation and uh, taking out of our shrinking uh, carbon budget. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah, it will be interesting to see how the sort of potential proposal for a polluting taxonomy or a significantly harmful taxonomy evolves in the next um, few months. Um, Robin, I'll let you um, reply to some of the comments Lucy made, of course, and you also actually have a question here from the audience specifically for you. Um, so maybe you can do both at the same time. I'm conscious of time as well. We only have five minutes left, three minutes actually. Um, Robin, um, as you wait for companies to catch up in terms of sustainability reporting and reporting on key ESG metrics, at what point are you waiting too long? What consequences will DWS enforce for slow or insufficient reporting? What are your sort of red lines do you have in place yeah. for this? I mean, I mentioned at the very beginning um, our, our net zero pledge that we launched at the end of 2020. Of course, that will force us to publish interim targets, which we actually did uh, in mid-October um, this year, um, also validated by the, uh, by the appropriate organization. So I cannot comment on that in too great detail, but that will um, be announced beginning of November for DWS. And that will, of course, um, take some more severe consequences in case of fossil fuels. Um, you cannot um, do a net zero pledge and still um, and then still engage into that kinds of um, sectors. So of course um, those uh, those are the appropriate steps that we are taking, and of course um, the appropriate policies will follow in very uh, due course. I cannot comment too much about this because it's not yet released by by my company. But of course the overarching um, the overarching principle for us is the net zero commitment that we have uh, also um, also um, subject to science based targets so that will that will follow and i can say it will be very more to come in the very near future thank you robin and maybe moving to to sean to pick up on um the net zero policies that we're seeing we're seeing them from individual investors from companies we also have the raft of sort of net zero alliances uh, being formed now ahead of ahead of COP26. How impactful do you think uh, these alliances uh, will be? Because that is an example, I suppose, of investors joining forces in a way to uh, to meet net zero. You know, the trouble with climate change is very volatile, <laughs> including emotionally. You know, you look at the science on morning, you think, oh, my God. And then the next day you read. The global and sustainable bonds market is $2.5 trillion US outstanding. And you think, Jesus, that is good. And investors are being to move. So I want to stress, you know, it's very hard to maintain an even keel in all of this. And I'm going to say the investor coalitions are fantastic. You know, honestly, truly, it is fantastic. Is that enough? No. 
abstract. Let's be clear about that. Is it incredibly useful and helpful? Yes. And we will see more coming out of this. So, but I'm looking on a bad day, and I'm going to admit this morning when I had a look at this, some of the science reports, I felt like I had one of these Kabul, Kabul moments. Oh my <laughs> God, the capital is falling in two days instead of two months kind of feeling, which is what, which I'm going to warn everyone now, which is what climate science is going to be like in the next 20 years, what our breeding of the economy is going to be like. It's going to be a lurch from event to event, thinking we're okay, we're not okay, we're okay, we're not okay. That is the nature of these kinds of nonlinear changes. So the key thing is, it is important to celebrate what we have done. It is important to celebrate the co investor coalitions. It is important to celebrate the investor engagement narrative that Robin has brought to us. Fantastic and important. I'm going to say it is really important. It is important to celebrate the green bonds market. It's important to celebrate the taxonomy. These are material advances. It's just that we've got to keep a prize, get an eye on the prize, which is what we have to do is still so far out of reach. The Titanic is still heading for the iceberg. And so while we make sure we understand that what we're doing is important and good, unfortunately, because this is, this is going to be tiring after a while, unfortunately, we've <laughs> got to go the extra mile. There are significant extra miles we have to do. We have to fight. We have to fight, and we have to fight fast if we're going to create some kind of even reasonably sustainable future for our children. Thanks a lot, John. I think this is a good note to end on. Celebrate, but fight at the same time. <laughs> so with that, I would like to thank you. Thanks. Thank our excellent speakers, Robin, Lucy and Sean and Yusuf, of course, for um, hosting this session. Um, I believe now we've got a 10 minute uh, coffee break before the next session. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And apologies, we didn't get to all of your questions. Um, I hope you find, found the session useful. Many thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here to, today to moderate the session. How could the sustainable finance policy framework be optimized to maximize investor impact? Uh, I'm Anne Catherine Santraré, the Novetic CEO, and I'm very pleased to have three panelists uh, Robert Bloom, head of sustainability at Universal Investment Group, uh, Florian Hebb, researcher at the Center for Sustainable Finance and Private Wealth at the University of Zurich, Hello, and everybody. we hope uh, to have also Sia Papitikanen, which is a, who is a European member parliament, but uh, she will join us. Uh, at, she's here. So, Sia welcome. Very nice to have you. 
so maybe after before the questions to you uh, so the rules will be i make a short introduction after that i will uh, have a, a q a sessions with our panelists and at the end um, i can take uh, your question if you put them in the chat i will uh, select some of them and if you have a special question for a special question for one of our uh, panelists, please tell um, for who it's your questions. Uh, so maybe first to to introduce uh, the the topic, um, European sustainable finance uh, policy frameworks come from the EU uh, sustainable finance action plan uh, launched in 2018. Uh, it brings in br it brings new concepts like taxonomy or uh, sustainable finance disclosure regulation, uh, well known as um, as an acronym, SFDR, and the meaning of the action plan was shifting the trillions uh, to low carbon, and inclusive economy designed by EU Green Deal. Um, so, uh, or next generation, or farm to fork, for example, for agriculture. That's why investors uh, face face right now a huge pressure to deliver measurable impact on this shift they are supposed to uh, begin. Uh, some of them, uh, they, they told, they tell to their customers they have done it. So three years later, later we uh, are in the middle of the world because we just, uh, the policy framework is not really ready because we have some pieces of the framework, not all of, uh, of it. And um, we just have a part of the taxonomy related to climate issues. Uh, we have others, we will come later. But the agenda of all the action plan is really um, it's, uh, coming step by step. And that's one of the points uh, underlined by investors to say it's too difficult right now because we don't have, we just have a, a small part of the pieces. Um, if we are talking about SFDR, uh, that's a, a very strong example because uh, you know that since March, uh, asset managers have to classify their funds, their sustainable funds between Article 8 and Article 9. And Novetic will launch uh, on uh, its quarterly market data, November 9. And we will we have analyzed the French market, and especially the sustainable funds classified Article 9. And the results <laughs> is that we really have a few, few information about the sustainable objectives of these kind of funds and the kind of sustainable indicators they have is really poor. We just found one uh, funds related, which have an objective related to taxonomy with a percentage of part of the taxonomy among more than 300. So you see we are, and that's why it's very interesting to have this uh, conversation right now uh, because uh, we will talk about okay we have a policy framework we have a, a global uh, project how do we uh, push forward uh, asset managers to really keep in mind the um, the spirit of the action plan and uh, not to uh, always uh, sustain because uh, because uh, they have not all the global picture. So my first question is for you, Sirpa. Uh, do you think that this framework, as it is right now, as I explained, is able to deliver the kind of impacts you were expect you were expected three years ago? Maybe you are mute. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, well, thank you, anne Catherine, and uh, thank you for organizing this event because I think that this uh, uh, future of sustainable finance needs a lot of talk and specialists to be on board. Uh, this actually uh, answers uh, the expectations of the Parliament much better than the first age leg uh, report. It has very good elements, and that goes to the reporting the CSRD uh, directive, the reporting on, uh, of the industries that goes uh, on taking the banking on board, expecting to have that on 
uh, uh, cap, uh, capital requirements on, on banking and on next uh, steps of uh, Basel. It has the elements of uh, be, being an active uh, builder of uh, international architecture that we know is crucial part of there and a lot of our other elements that I don't go now in, in detail. But what I would like to underline that I still would like to see much better there is the very sound database. And indeed, I think that that should be the responsibility on European Union level and on the global level. And the Parliament has been discussing, and I've been proposing that we should actually agree, uh, hopefully, on the Glasgow meeting on starting on building a global uh, roadmap to sustainable finance. And a part of that roadmap, we should have that kind of a data space uh, uh, globally, where, be it that then on so uh, in in a stability board or be it in IFRS or where independent of the UN framework, where it would have the calculation methodology, the LCAs, and how you calculate uh, the, the uh, major significant <laughs> uh, impacts, be it um, biodiversity and so on. And to come, so are you really confident about the? the possibility to find a global framework when we see, for example, about taxonomy, uh, how France and Germany and others are not really, uh, don't agree about the kind of energy which is uh, taxo compatible. <laughs> uh, so uh, is it not, are you, not, uh, are you disappointed by the, the, the lack of uh, common vision of European uh, countries about what could be sustainable uh, for taxonomy and for other tools on the policy framework. Uh, thank you, anne Catherine, because uh, I'm more than disappointed. I'm appalled. And exactly this is the reason I think that we should fight, fight for this kind of a data space. A bit like you do not vote on IFRS, how you calculate the return on investment. We shouldn't have the taxonomy and the reporting a hostage of national short-termism and at least imagine the interests uh, uh, because <clears throat> I, I do have sometimes nightmares that we could have a green gas and <clears throat> the Nord Stream 2 and nuclear labeled as green and that would kill the whole taxonomy on my opinion. So anyway, that would be sort of the sound database and uh, that's why I think that that kind of a data space should uh, be created in, in connection with the Eurostat. And then again, I would leave a bit more free uh, uh, leeway uh, for uh, different kind of, uh, 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 not reporting standards, uh, but interpretations there, because we know that then when you have the social biodiversity and all elements, you can't have this kind of a methodology that you have in taxonomy that you define product and industry by industry, what is green and sustainable, but you would need to have this kind of a IFRS uh, log accounting logic reference that you uh, measure in the same way with the same data. And then oh, about the different kind of... Uh, uh, combinations of sustainability would, would be a bit more left to markets to, to consider uh, how they uh, would like to emphasize it. May I come back to the, the sustainable objectives? Because um, uh, EU Commission organized a summit uh, October 7, EU Green Invest, and the message, is, and the message was very clear that EU Sustainable Finance Action Plan has the purpose to uh, to be uh, to make the link between Green Deal and uh, asset management for European asset managers. And when you we check the data or the objectives of the policy of the the, the DCs of all the the, the papers <laughs> produced by asset managers, we are very very far from that. So how do you think that you could work on which kind of incentives uh, could uh, European Parliament or, I don't know, 
some European authority, authorities uh, to make this point because this it's impossible to shift the trillions if uh, asset managers are still very very um, want just don't want to engage them into this kind of work to say okay this product is uh, able to help farm to fork to be a reality when or no uh, or carbon neutrality. It's a very mm -hmm. uh, concrete example. So what do you mean about that? Well, I think that there we could have a quite a lot of help uh, by the process that is done in central banking systems and ECB in the Europe, where they calculate the risk. And uh, there I refer to the Basel and maybe uh, when it comes to insurance risk assessment too. And so if you can put out of the uh, um, alert on riskier investments, this is much more important than just showing that this would be green and nice. If you are shown that a third of your investment, and as you might know, it is uh, one third of the global assets are in sunk assessments, fossil dependent on otherwise risky assets. So we need to put the label on that and also a label on I do not know because in financial sector it is the same. It's not excuse to say I don't know. You are labeled alert uh, uh, if you do not know and you do not disclose and it should be on the sustainability side the same. And I think that by that really sort of kicking one third of the investment capital moving from wrong to, to better uh, would do the uh, trick. So thank you, Siapa. That's a good connection. I, Sorry, I you want, want to add something? Very briefly, yeah. uh, where I'm disappointed and I hope that you as investors could uh, uh, kick off the uh, uh, Europe is that the public money should have uh, the same uh, requirements. So no subsidies for fossil fuels, do no, no, do no uh, significant harm. And uh, uh, they should uh, uh, put their money on, on green investments as well, not only to ask the private to do it. <laughs> yeah, strong message that I think it's really useful for many uh, public uh, Public bank, for example. Uh, so, Robert, your Universal Investment Group is one of the biggest European funds platform. So, uh, to react uh, of uh, what Sirpat uh, told us, first, maybe could you tell us which part of your offer is already flagged as sustainable and how do you comply to this uh, Article 8 and 9 classification? Sure. Um Maybe the start of, as you mentioned, a big platform. We have more than 700 billion assets and administration. We are roughly 60 billion are retail. I think that's important to know when we talk about a bit of the numbers. Um, when we talk about flag, the sustainable, seeing as we talk about the SFDR, Article 8 or 9, um, on the retail side, around one fifth of those products on our platform are flagged um, as Article 8 or 9. And I think that's mainly due to the start that. A lot of our partners um, needed a better understanding. The 10th of March was a very critical day, and a lot of our partners were, um, I wouldn't call it afraid, but they weren't sure. And also we as a whole industry, I think, weren't exactly sure. Everybody was doing it for the first time. So we started um, building up our own framework a bit of, a bit of our own interpretation. As a service management company, we are not really reflected within the framework. So we had to come up with our interpretation. We made a very, um, I would say, sophisticated decision tree, what we consider as an Article 8 or Article 9, because what our main objective was here to be transparent and also be able to give our partners and then also their clients a real good understanding of what for us means Article 8 and 9. And that's just not mean to have, well, we don't do, um, I don't know, um, cluster ammunitions and that's a sustainable fund then, right? We, we need more than that. And then, I mean, in, when we think about it, what I think people always misunderstand as well as Article 8 or 9 just means you're allowed to market as a sustainable fund. We when see, we uh, the, example, uh, yeah. Robert, we saw on the French market some asset managers which use Article 9 as a label. They design something very uh, uh, yeah. with a European flag. It's really something strange, but uh, we were surprised that some asset managers understood that like that. So would do you yeah. mean it's really a problem? Uh, no? completely agree. I mean, it's a, 
there's a whole misconception i think in part because of when we talk about classification right and in our industry we think about oh that's a label then that's something but um, it is not a label right i mean there are there are labels um on national levels on, on international levels for that but this is more that we can say with the if you're on article 8 you're allowed to market your fund as sustainable what this means is actually quite broad right and then when you think about on the institutional side a lot of our clients there they didn't really have the need to classify yet because they were cool, still uncertain. And they already did a lot of that. But they said, well, I don't exactly know what do I have to report on. So I'm not doing it right now, even though a lot of our institutional clients in, in their structures are already very, very sustainable because they've done this for years, especially when we think about um, insurances to a certain degree or even um, bigger companies for their portfolio for their for their own portfolio right to to looking for um let's say uh, in general insurance uh, for their own workforce and in that sense um we see that there's a bit of a shift on the retail side it became as you say kind of more like a label did you need this as a kind of as a as a flag as we saw in other like um spaces in the industry whereas on the institutional side it became more like do i really need this because it is I don't know exactly what to do with it to a certain degree, or I don't really need it because in the end, I don't market my product because it's just for me. So I don't really have to build it up. And in, in that sense, I would say what we are now seeing coming to the end of the year, coming for the taxonomy, then now the SFDR level two next year, we see a lot, I wouldn't say more certainty, but we seem to be, to be trying to get a better understanding and we see more partners now thinking about of a reclassification on the retail side, there is a bit of a, I would say, a draft towards this because people still see it as a label and it has been marketed as a label, but also on the institutional side, seeing it, okay, well, we want to produce those um, those reports, those data, and want to show what we are actually doing, right? So if I summarize, it's work in progress. I don't know if you had the time to have a look on the RTS, the draft of RTS launched by ISAS on Friday. Um, if yes, uh, how do you see that between your, the system of your ESG uh, reporting framework, uh, which is directly linked to MSCI data, if I understood correctly? So how do you work uh, to build uh, ESG reporting in the meaning of SFDR, as it is for with PNI, PAI, and something like that, with uh, MSCI data you have already you have already in your system. How do you work on that? Is it easy? I guess no. But how do you try to make the link with uh, for so many funds into your for your platform? Um, well, that's a very good question. I mean, firstly, <laughs> I mean our platform is is not just the security sides, right? There's also a lot of all the alternative sides and the real estate side, so that we talk about completely different data providers. Um, and yes, I had a, a first look at what was published last week, but not in detail yet because we, we're looking from different angles on it right now. But the general point is here what we see. I mean, there's a framework now. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure if this is, I mean, it's in the development stage, let's put it like that. And what we're seeing is what we were trying to with, I mean, right now, yes, we're using MSCI as one of the, let's call them the big data. Um, in my understanding, if you use um, one of the other big names just to not exclude them, or if you use ISS, Arabesque, or whoever you, we want to see those system analytics, um, they're all giving you a kind of a starting point, right, from this information. Um, what we heard in the panel before, right, that there's a lot happening also still based on estimates, which is because we are still having a huge problem called data gap, right? I mean, we have to report on certain things which people have not really measured yet. We're doing a lot of approximations. so. What we are trying right now to do is to give a, at least of a better understanding, right, as a starting. I, I, I don't see those uh, those reports, the principal adverse impact statements in the beginning as the, the final version already, but it is maybe a starting point to get a sense of where we are right now as a status quo. And then I agree where you were linking it, right? Is this data even enough to give us a full picture? And then when we talk about impact, right, then of course, like what kind of impact are we talking about? I mean, we heard it in the discussion before with double materiality. Um, I'm also thinking about this corporate versus investor impact. So it is very, very um, difficult to, to put all of this together. What we are right now doing is we're trying to use the data 
available. In that sense, yes, we partnered right now with MSCI and trying to, to fill out most of those reports and seeing where we get this data from. But what we're also doing as for our platform and for our partners, looking for new data providers, seeing, okay, what is out there? How can we be more honing in on what is actually needed? And that in the end is reliable data, not just based on estimates, but also thinking about, are we actually looking from the right angles on those investments, right? And I mean, that, uh, that, that is a huge point. Yeah, thank you, Robert. My last question will be about environmental performances of green funds. Um, we survey European green funds in Novetic for since 10 years, and we will publish our last survey uh, 24, November 24. And uh, one of our main points is to see that uh, it's really difficult to have to measurement, to have measures about uh, green performances as you do for financial performances, even on social. And we just have a few uh, indicators and all of them are related to climate. Uh, we have the carbon emission of human rights funds, for example. So that's a huge point, but uh, it's really something strange. And when we are talking about the, the kind of the, the, the first uh, category of customers, it's really difficult to understand if I have a thematic funds about human rights or social issues and I have a carbon footprint, what is the point? And if I have something which is uh, a green funds related to, I don't know, waste management or something like that, it's also the same issue. It's more interesting to have uh, the kind of impact related to waste. So uh, my point is to say, what is your perception about uh, the expectations of uh, customers are to have social or, or, or and uh, environmental performances as they have financial performances, and we are very far from that. Do you think it's possible, and do you work on this kind of uh, framework? Um, yes, I mean, maybe to, to your first point, I, I completely agree, right? When there's a fund about social, uh, um, let's human rights, and you get the CO2 data, right? I mean, of course, in the end, it's all connected, but that's why I think it's good to be there. Also at the adverse impacts, if you just focus on one, you should always look at the others as well. But I agree, we have a, I mean, that's why we see as well when, when we look at the industry right now, the most of the impact funds or are on CO2 because this is the most common and it's, it's, it's in the news and it's very, very important. Don't get me wrong, but I agree. We, we need to have more factors on the social side, on the governance side as well, right? I mean, that, that's where the source, especially on the governance, this is the route which will enable companies, corporations um, to grow their sustainable footprint and become better. And yes, there's now this for, I would say, the last two years, becoming in that we used the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which were made for countries, now to put them on the on corporations and on investments to try and go in this direction to be like, well, um, now you get an impact on the SDG 4 and 5 and 7, for example, as, as a kind of as, as numbers, because we in the industry, we need numbers, right? We need factors to, to prove that we did this in the right direction. But I agree, we are, we, we are missing certain link and we're building this up and uh, what we are doing as well we are trying to develop new frameworks also from from the risk angle there to give us a better understanding um and what we are doing also we, we're working and analyzing with a lot of new partners in the industry we're coming up with new ideas how to measure those things right there, there's a there's a, a massive amount of new companies startups a bit like mature startups in Europe as well, who are coming up with new ideas how, how to measure those things. And I think that, that will be the important thing to to foster them. And that's what we're doing as platform as well, to connect them, to discuss with them and bring them in. Because right now, I agree. I mean, everything is focused on a few data points, some of them even estimates on it. And what we have to do is like build everything around. And when we talk about impact, right? I mean, what impact do we really want to measure? Do we really want to only measure the corporate impact or do we really want to measure with the investments what we did okay what really happened and what really happened when the i don't know the school was built what is the aftermath in the next two three years in this region right on the social and the governance side those will become interesting points but realistically we are still in the first level and trying there so i think this is um going in the right direction but i don't think we will have this within the next year right but I think this is where we have to go. We have to see not only where we invested, but what the investment does and then what does the investment do over time.
So thank thank you. Uh, I think that Florian is very interesting about the the things you are saying about the the real impact that you need to measure. As a researcher, Flo, Florian, Florian, but maybe, uh, could you give us to to could you give to us some insights about impact? How do we define impact? Because it's uh, the mm. the name dropping of impact is everywhere in sustainable finance right now, but nobody is talking about the same thing. So could you give to us a, a common definition about as a researcher, what do you mean about impact of sustainable finance? Thanks, Anne Cratin, and, and happy to to do so. So maybe first to say when I this morning I, I have had a look at the, the report, the new Eurosif report, I was really happy to see that it the title is Fostering Investor Impact, placing yes. it at the heart of sustainable finance. So I mean we have seen this incredible growth of sustainable finance over, over the last years. Some estimates say that they have 35 trillion US dollars in sustainable so the market is really growing and I think we're really now at the point where we need to have a closer look and ask, you know, does it really deliver the change it promises, this industry? Or better, how can we optimize the change it promises? And for this we really need a good understanding how investments and investors can create real world change and and that's what we have been researching um, for the last five years at the center for sustainable finance and private wealth we, we have published our investors guide to impact where we summarize our results and uh, Andrew, you, you asked for a definition so i can maybe share some insights are really crucial when, when talking about the real world impact of investments so i think first of all what is impact so impact is a change you cause with a certain activity just very generic that sounds trivial, but it has the cause inside. So impact is always causal. So you need always to have a look at what would have happened without a certain activity. So the counterfactual in impact investing, it's often called additionality. So impact is only what happens beyond what would have happened anyhow. Now, if we, if in, in some cases, that's easy to, to assess. If I buy an electric car and replace my fossil driven car, that's pretty obvious. I mean, I don't, you know, my fossil fuel consumption goes down immediately. So I have cause and effect. If I look at an investment, it's way more complicated. And uh, Robert, you have already mentioned it. It, it. Here, it really helps differentiate between investor impact and company impact. So company impact being the change companies cause in real world, that the impact they have on people, on planet, on ecosystems, and so on with their services, with their corporate activities, with their operations. And investor impact, which is the change you as an investor cause in company impact. So, so that's way more complicated because I mean, the, the basic problem is that as for investments, impact is always moderated over financial markets. So it's really important to consider what the effect you as an investor have on, on, on certain companies, whether you actually cause um, any change. And uh, we, we see in our research, we, we focused on or found two fundamentally different ways how investors can have investor impact. First of all, it's, it's the growth channel. So investors can promote the growth of green companies by allocating capital to these companies, deliberately allocating capital to help them grow. But the first caveat we found here is we didn't find any evidence that this works for large mature companies trading on public markets. So we found plenty of evidence that this works for... Uh, if I'm correct, to be sure to understand you, uh, it's really more difficult. For example, if I have some shares from Total Energy or something like that, they have some green um, we have enfin, some renewables. Mm. How do I measure my impacts? Because I have, I don't know, X percent of uh, the capital of Total to say what is my green impact? Sure. I mean, that's an incredibly tricky question. I mean, Total is, is even a kind of a tricky case because it's also not only green. That's let's, why let's take, I mentioned it. Let, let's, take, let's take Vestas, for example, a completely yeah, green company. If, if I bear, buy a share of Vestas, will Vestas produce more wind turbines? So that's the big question in the room. So here we find little evidence. I mean, there is, in theory, this could work. You know, you, you, you give a company, you buy stocks, this may increase stock prices, this may improve cost of capital, this may incrementally improve the growth. I mean, that's a theory, but so far we do not see any evidence to, to so support that theory 
credibly. On the other hand, we see evidence for smaller companies, you know, for startups, for developing countries and so on, that capital allocation really can make a difference. But especially, I mean, there's a there's a second pathway we have identified which could work for Total, which is in, in encouraging improvements. So taking the, the shareholder rights, taking your voice as an investor, your right, approaching companies and encouraging them to do whatever they do in a greener way. So making brown companies somewhat greener. So that's not fundamentally transforming where you know the economy is going. So Total will still produce oil for, for quite a while. But I mean, it, it may increase its share in, in renewable investments, for example. That's something investors can achieve. I think having these two things in mind when, when looking at also what we discussed now, um, uh, regulations and policies is, 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 is really important, I think, especially how these policies could improve their real life, real world impact over time. Uh, that's absolutely true, but uh, to, um, if we mention the title of this session, how it's important, uh, the regulation framework, but how could we maximize the impact of this framework? And you are uh, in Swiss, uh, in Switzerland. So do you see uh, differences between uh, EU framework over what happens in Switzerland about that? Do you have now a kind of framework which is useful to push a sustainable finance, uh, more and more efficient to shift the trillions to a low carbon and inclusive economy? And uh, I will come back to you, Sirpa, because as maybe you see the question about, uh, you saw, I guess, uh, how uh, UK tried to build something like uh, something like the EU framework on sustainable finance. So could you tell us more about the differences and how it, is it right now a problem because, because of the Brexit? Uh, you have a UK system and you have a European system which are not really, they have some connection, but not really uh, all the same. So Robert, uh, Florian, sorry, first, um, okay. what do you, think about the the different kind of uh, sustainable policy framework maybe with very concrete with switzerland and eu what are the main differences for you i mean as usual i think switzerland is always taking a bit slower a careful approach not coming up with strict regulation what i see on the market is anyhow the sfdr is what the swiss industry has to cater to because i mean there's only very few asset managers that entirely focus on Switzerland. So it, it's an a European, European market in some ways anyhow. And if I look at the effectiveness of the SFDR, I think my key point would be that it mainly focuses on company impact. And right now, I think it neglect, neglects to some part investor impact. So the SFDR mainly talks about what is inside, which companies do funds invest in, and not about which effect do investments have on these companies. We have been talking about Article 8 and 9. In my view, Article 9 mainly favors these traditional, these classical thematic funds, you know, focusing, for example, on companies that, that are in the renewable space. Here you can, I mean, sustainable investing is defined, you know, as in the SFDR as investing in sustainable sectors, for example, in the Vestas and Teslas of this world. But then my challenge here is, is, is you know, putting, amassing funds and assets into large cap um, companies in already sustainable um, industries, is that the most effective way to, to promote change, given that we have legal evidence that this actually alters the growth case? And what about engagement or, or like approaches that really, we have strong evidence that it, 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 it causes change? Like, so are you in favor about something like uh, transition label or, or I don't know, transition indicators or a way to assess the kind of engagement done uh, that uh, investors have to give some uh, have to give some evidences about the way they put pressure on companies to make that transition or what do you have in mind about that? I think that these are certainly really interesting approaches. I mean. So far, our view on, 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 on impact in public market is that investors are likely to have the largest impact if they focus on transition rather on, you know, making their portfolios look green and just shifting uh, brown companies out of their portfolio, focusing on making companies greener from brown. And I think currently the SFDR could do some work on, on incorporating this transition um, view better. 
especially and, and also the second part is the SFDR could maybe also uh, be improved in, in, in terms of focusing, I mean, finding a better and clearer space for traditional impact investments. So impact in, investments that really try to allocate capital where it's needed in, in terms to, to foster sustainable development. So if right now these products that often really are risking going in, in, in emerging markets and so on developing, they're kind of put in the same bucket bucket as like as, as thematic funds on listed public markets here in Europe and the US. It's both Article 9, it's dark green. Some even label Article 9 as impact, which I found is, is not legitimate without further establishing how you're going to have an investor impact with this product. So I think in these these two two areas, kind of how do traditional impact investments in illiquid market fit into the picture and how can transition really be transparently communicated and, and also put the, how the regulation also put some pressure on the industry to, to really credibly then um, show how, how transitional impact is, is created. That, that could be, that would be interesting spaces. So I come back to you, Sirpa, because as we can see with all our panelists, uh, there is a great confusion about uh, what, what asset managers are doing and what kind of thing they explain to their customers. And uh, some and very important point, it's really difficult for the one who do the best to be differences, well, to uh, market the uh, their differences compared to others who say, I, uh, I love sustainability, I do a lot of work in this space, and that's a very big issue. So uh, first question uh, about the differences between EU and UK and uh, that sustainable finance is now competition uh, aspects. Well, it's a part of the competition between uh, parts of the world, different parts of the world. And second, how could you do something maybe as uh, for the European Parliament to um, try to find a way, a kind of regulation which is maybe more directive but more clear about what are the expectations or, uh, to, or maybe stronger, I don't know. First question and second question, I recommend. I hope that they are clear. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, there seems to be this kind of a competition and it starts to be global. And we all know that the USA model is even more sort of further apart uh, with their terminology and thinking. And what is a good news is that the Asians are creating their own models. And so I, I, I'm a bit divided. Should I be happy or unhappy? Happy in one hand, because the competition means someone sooner or later is going to raise the bar and this is the reflection on the eu and the taxonomy and whether to label nuclear and whether to label the gas and so on so <clears throat> it might be a healthy competition as well and what makes me sad is that because this uh, requires a lot of technical work and combining financial data <clears throat> and environmental data also has said what need to, uh, needs to be done in global level, because if you look the whole LCA, the whole sort of a chain, supply chains of uh, complex industries, otherwise you do not make any sense what is actually sustainable or not. And there uh, I've been very encouraged uh, with the thinking that uh, uh, seems to be in City of the London and the big actors in the UK to try it at least to um, in line the thinking in uh, in EU and in UK, but uh, so far it's not there, and it remains to be seen what happens. And I said this would need to be global. Uh, then I would have one question, uh, if I may, uh, yeah. to Robert and Florian, and this goes to this transition partly also. And I've been thinking, should we have a, a separate category of transition in the future? Actually, a separate regulation where it would say that, okay, whatever is the industry, if the camp company has a transition plan to be sustainable by 2030 or 35, if it follows the track, and if it uses the harmonized indicators and the methodologies and so on, 
And if it is third uh, party, did I say uh, audited, uh, then it could be labeled transitional. And then why not green on the latter end? So instead of going sector by sector and trying to figure out what is transition in uh, uh, in gas and what is uh, maybe green and what is a significant harm, you, you would try to do something like that. And I'm not sure myself if this is a good or bad idea. So I would appreciate your comments. And the second is that uh, there's a still a debate uh, uh, out there that when we are going to have the social taxonomy, should we sort of um, have the both taxonomies that you can be labeled sustainable? Uh, and I'm inclined to think a bit on that end. Um, <clears throat> Uh, or could we have that kind of a sort of a, a, a separate categories, a bit like you can have organic or fair trade coffee, <laughs> that uh, you could be either social and get that sort of a label or, or then the environmental? Maybe, Robert, first, and if I may, uh, fair and organic could be the best product in uh, in Switzerland, I guess, in Germany also. The idea was to make uh, the link between the two because Customers want both. Uh, so, Robert, uh, maybe first on this issue, uh, because we will have a short uh, round about uh, social and environmental, how do we mix or not uh, taxonomies? And after that, to come to transition, because it's more complicated. And we okay. still have eight minutes. Understood. I'll try to keep it short. Um, uh, yeah. I I, I think the, the mix, there has to be a connection in the end there, right, between the taxonomies. And we have to um yeah put it together and make sense of it because it is a whole and you can't always just pick out one piece and just look at one piece and then neglect all the rest so there has to be a connection and for me i think the more interesting part is really the the, the transformation part right and i mean i think florence said as well when we think about measuring impact where 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 will it be right when we start with a let's call them, even though I don't like this green and brown, because green is always just about E, but we have S and G as well. But let's say for the sake of it, green, when we start with green company, helping that they're already green, but the real stuff which can change and which will help us in terms of the big problems we have is actually converting brown companies or helping brown companies to, to change. So there, there should definitely be um, an area for that in the investment world. I mean, we see it on our platform as well. There, there are different strategies, right? They are the ones who exclude those companies and they're the ones who actually target them and try to change them. And I think for both is a room there and for both should be a room there to express and also be able to say, well, I have a sustainable fund here. I have a sustainable strategy if my aim is to help companies transition because that That's is noble and it is a great impact and it will have... Um, a very, very good impact for us. Sorry. That makes the transition with the question of Sierpa about transition. So that's your meaning about uh, the kind of transition we can uh, organize around sustainable funds? Yeah, I, I would say when, when we talk about transition and uh, and giving it a better place or actually a, a first a proper place within the legal frameworks, it will help um, asset managers as well, the industry to understand, okay, where can we set up and what would be considered still sustainable because transition is a big part and we can't just, we, the, again, comes to the first point again, we can't just focus on one point and leave the rest behind, right? So we need transition and help companies uh, to transition. So Florian, you talked about transition, uh, your definition, <laughs> what do you, what do you answer to SIRPA? When she asked to you, uh, what do you mean by transition? I have some suggestion. What do you mean about that? Uh, so, I think this is an excellent idea of, of, of having maybe a separate uh, label or kind of category focusing on transition. Because I think looking at the evidence, looking at the research, I think this is the role investors, at least on liquid markets, which the SFDR is, is currently about, can play. Pushing for transition in the sense of working with companies to improve. And we had a question about shifting the drilling. Does the SFDR really shift the trillions? I'm doubtful that the SFDR ever will shift the trillions in, in the meaning of taking away money from brown companies, shifting into green companies. That's not how financial markets work, at least not efficient financial markets Europe and US work in. But I think 
the SFDR could, could have the space of, of promoting, you know, companies worth trillions getting greener. And, and here, I think having a, a clear spot for transition and a clear narrative for that investors can also invest in brown companies if these companies really improve and if investors really push these companies to to improve step by step. And as you mentioned, you know, have have clear targets, have these targets verified, have tracked that companies actually meet these targets year by year. I think from an impact perspective, this this could be very strong because else I fear a bit if you're only focusing on, on Article 9 and dark green in the sense of owning green companies, a lot of positive momentum could be lost. So I think you answer also to the question uh, uh, from the audience about the effectiveness of the EU taxonomy or SFDR uh, to... Uh, to try to have sustainable act economic activities in five or 10 years. Uh, so maybe a last point for you, Robert. Uh, do you think that this EU framework with a taxonomy and SFDR is effective, has a strong effectiveness if you are looking at in five, year, five or 10 years? Well, compared to not having it, it is definitely effective. And um, I, I think we are, we are definitely um, on the right way here. And we're talking not about, we always talk about zero and one, right? We have to be from tomorrow on, we have to be 100%. We won't be there yet. But I think, and I'm quite confident that, um, and that's also why I see the question. I, I'm not there to challenge, but I think we should always challenge those things because this will make us better. And we are on the right way. And yes, could we be more effective? Of course we could but we are going in the right direction. Do we have to speed up? Yes, we do. But we are going in the right direction we are talking about, and that's what we're doing today. That was discussed in the first panel, and that's what Super said in the beginning, right? We need more discussion, we need more connection, and this will help us. And in that sense, I'm confident that we will be definitely more effective than not having the SFDR or the taxonomy within the next five or 10 years. So Serpa agrees to you. Um, maybe last, last question, but it's a huge question, Victor, uh, for Florian. Is there a decoupling between ESG growth and the precise investment we need to meet the climate objectives? Uh, I don't know if you can answer to that in two minutes, man. no more, because it's a very complicated case questions. No? Yeah, I think it, it, it is one of the most crucial questions. I mean, which role do have you know high emitters to play in the transition? I mean, should we have a more kind of clear role saying, clear view saying we just exclude these companies, we do not work with them, um, and or should we rather include them in a in a vision kind of we we need also to transform these these industries? I mean, I, I personally I think if we go first too strongly. On the exclusion side, we risk brown spinning, just a separation of the shiny ESG world and an entire different economy where these companies still exist and produce oil, but they're kind of way far further away for, from the public eyes because they're owned by, by private equity companies and so on. On the other hand, I always think making clear statements helps the political dialogue. Just yes, we had a few days ago, the announcement of a huge um, Dutch pension fund that they're going out of um, fossil fuels. This also helps the, pro the political process in fighting climate change. And I think that's, for me, that's always a very important um, aspect. Sustainable finance is a great tool to, to tackle the world's challenges, but it, it it's ineffective alone. We need very strong regulation, especially to, to tackle climate change. So sustainable finance is only one wheel within a, in a larger machinery, and we shouldn't kind of have the illusion that, that just with this private sector action, we will save um, climate change. So, so it's really important to, to structure it efficiently in supporting regulation and not in a way that, 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 we, uh, that we create the illusion that we can't do without regulation because we have sustainable finance and all this growth. Thanks a lot. Uh, Sirpa, maybe to close this uh, panel, uh, are you sure that we have enough political leadership on these topics to really move uh, European economy to a more low carbon and inclusive uh, model? Well, it depends when you ask me. Uh, <laughs> uh, the different answer. So, some days when I'm seeing my colleagues and the member states haggling with the taxonomy, my, my answer would be definitely no. 
and then some days when you get suddenly progress in some of the areas and especially when you have a very strong uh, 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 outcome and uh, outreach from the uh, investor and financial sector it always pushes the things a bit further then i'm clear optimist that i i think yes it does Probably it's like always in, in politics. It gets slightly corrupted. It isn't quite what we need. But as Florian said about the system, it's definitely better to have it than not to have it because then you really couldn't make any difference between totally corrupted green claims and uh, then with the huge diversity of different green claims what we are having on the markets. So thanks a lot, and we try to keep our optimism, to keep, to stay optimist about all these topics that you, uh, everybody here is very, uh, has a strong commitment. So thanks to all of you. And uh, I think that uh, for the audience, there is a strong, a short coffee break, and uh, you will have the last session around 12 uh, a.m. So see you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah, you. Well. Bye. Bye.
Hi everyone and welcome to the final panel of today's event. I'm Lizzie Meager, Policy Editor of Capital Monitor and first of all I wanted to say thank you to Eurosa for having me today. Um, so we have got loads to get through today on the topic of improving climate policy to trigger a transition in the real world economy, which is obviously such a hugely important subject. Um, I think in financial circles, we can sometimes get a bit bogged down in the details and forget what our ultimate goal should be um, here, which is, of course, reducing emissions in the real world. So loads to talk about. Um, and I'd like to introduce my panellists before we kick off. So with me today are Ben Allen, Research Director at the Institute for European Environmental Policy. Jules Besnenu, Director at Clean Tech Group and Clean Tech for Europe Initiative. Antoine Colombani, Member of the Cabinet, Cabinet of Franz Timmermans, who is, of course, Executive Vice President of the European Commission in charge of the Green Deal. And Maximilian Horster, Head of ISS ESG. Um, so thank you all so much for being here today. Um, we thought it would be really helpful um, before we kick off the panel discussion to have a very brief update on the European Commission's approach to real world climate policy so far. So I'm going to hand straight over to you, Antoine. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing uh, this and for, for the invitation. Um, I'll try to, to recap what we're trying to do with the Green Deal and in particular with the climate package that we've uh, put forward uh, last July, the so-called uh, Fit for 55 package. Um, as you know, the Green Deal is, is really conceived as a whole of government and even I would say whole of society approach uh, with the key objective, uh, of course, of achieving climate neutrality uh, in Europe by 2050, but also uh, all the uh, very important objectives on protection of biodiversity and ecosystems, on decoupling growth from uh, resource use, and very importantly, also putting social aspects and the, the just transition uh, really at the heart of the strategy and the, and the policy approach. Um, so, to achieve uh, climate neutrality, uh, one very important milestone is uh, to reduce emissions by at least 55% by 2030. And I want to stress that this is um, uh, not just a, a soft target, it is actually a hard target. It is a legal obligation at EU level now, which is enshrined in the EU uh, climate law. And so what we did in the package, uh, the so-called Fit for 55 package that we presented uh, last July um, is, is basically to uh, set out the concrete measures that will allow us to comply uh, with these obligations. Uh, and this is done through a very comprehensive uh, and complementary set of uh, pieces of legislation at EU level. Uh, in short, what we're trying to do is, a, is really a policy mix. It's a mix of uh, targets, of carbon pricing uh, instruments, of regulation and of investment. Uh, carbon pricing is, is of course paramount. Uh, it, it plays a key role uh, and it will continue to, to play a key role in the coming de decade. So the existing ETS uh, uh, will be tightened. Uh, to adjust to the new uh, minus 55% objective. Um, uh, and also this means a lower cap on, on emissions, but also we want to increase the use of the ETS in, uh, in aviation. We want to extend it to uh, maritime transport. And we also propose to introduce a carbon border adjustment mechanism for certain industrial products and materials uh, to avoid carbon leakage. Um, and then outside the uh, ETS uh, system, uh, I mean, the, the, the sectors which are covered by the current ETS system, we have emissions targets per member state. This is the so-called effort sharing regulation. But we also propose to create a new uh, ETS, a second ETS system to introduce also a carbon price for road transport and buildings. So here, uh, the idea is to uh, cap emissions in those sectors where clearly we're not on the right track. Uh, emissions have been increasing in transport. We also don't have the, the sufficient uh, pace of reduction in the building sector. Uh, but also I want to emphasize that uh, in those sectors, the pricing will not be enough. Uh, we need regulation as well. We need, for example, CO2, new CO2 uh, emission standards for cars where uh, new cars uh, put on the market should be zero emission by 2035. 
Uh, we need a mix of regulation and public support for building renovations as well. Uh, and I would add also that in industry to make the shift from, uh, I would say, what we've seen so far, uh, reduction of emissions and, uh, and efficiency gains in the current industrial processes, we need to now shift to different types of uh, in industrial processes to really have the, the low carbon uh, industry to, to get it going. And we need the investments to happen in the next decade for that so that uh, it can play its full role in the period after 2030. So that's also a key uh, challenge. So we are proposing there also uh, instruments, uh, the, the innovation fund from, uh, funded through the ETS, which will increase to, uh, to fund um, uh, low carbon uh, industry uh, projects also through the possible use of new instruments like so-called uh, contracts for difference. Uh, very briefly, we have also targets, uh, new targets in renewable energy, including uh, sub-targets for, for specific sectors, a higher target for reducing energy use uh, with, for example, a requirement for uh, the public sector to renovate 3% of its buildings each year. We also propose to revise uh, energy taxation rules uh, to realign tax incentives basically with the objectives of the Green Deal. In transport, there is a need for regulation as well. I mentioned the um, uh, regulation and investment, obviously. I mentioned already the CO2 standards for cars. We also propose requirements for member states to set up charging points uh, for, for uh, zero emissions uh, vehicles. Um, and uh, regulatory measures to ensure the take-up of uh, sustainable uh, fuels, uh, cleaner fuels in aviation and the maritime sector. Now, the social aspects are really at the heart of the approach as well. Uh, the companion, so to speak, to the new uh, ETS system that we are uh, proposing is the setup of a social climate fund where 25% of the re revenues uh, of emissions trading through this new system would be used uh, to um, basically uh, support vulnerable households to, to install cleaner heating sources, insulate um, their houses, uh, fund uh, cleaner vehicles, etc., etc. So this would be a fund of uh, $72 billion over seven years. And the amount could double if uh, member states match uh, this uh, this money. Um, and uh, the important thing is, is th this regulatory agenda goes with uh, a very uh, thorough and very um, uh, important investment plan. Uh, in particular through Next Generation EU, the tool uh, for the recovery, where we uh, basically jointly issue debt at EU level to fund uh, uh, member states' investment plans. 37% uh, of those plans is targeted at climate. Of course, more investment will be needed also from uh, public purses at national and regional level. Uh, there will be a need uh, for private investment. Obviously, you're all familiar with that and, and with everything we're doing on sustainable finance. So all of this is strongly complementary. And maybe to finish, just to, to mention that uh, a very um, uh, uh, important part of, the, of our proposals is to uh, grow the, the carbon sinks. Uh, we propose an EU target for carbon removals by natural sinks, so the, the land, forestry and, and agriculture sectors, uh, essentially. Uh, the so-called uh, Lulu CF. Um, so uh, this is a target, an EU-wide target of 310 million of tons uh, of CO2 uh, to be removed by 2030 with national targets. So member states will be required not to just stabilize the, the carbon sink as they are today, but to, to care for uh, the sink, to expand uh, the sink to meet this target. And we also uh, propose new criteria to ensure the sustainable uh, supply of bioenergy, a forest strategy to ensure better management of, uh, of forests. So we cover, uh, I would say, all angles uh, of the climate equation uh, with this very comprehensive package, which is now under discussion uh, by the co-legislators, the, the Council and the European Parliament. And with it, uh, we aim to provide a very, we already provided, I would say, a very clear direction to uh, investors uh, through the uh, 2050 and 2030 targets, which are now in the law. 
and now we will provide with the, the clear, stable, uh, and, and uh, I would say uh, credible regulatory framework that we need to uh, achieve, to actually achieve these climate targets. So I'll, I'll stop here because I think I've spoken too long already. Just, just a few things the Commission's working on then. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for that. Um, and obviously, I think a, a key um, thing that you were talking about there is, of course, the ETS. And um, it seems certainly from, from the conversations that I have that obviously it's so important for real world emissions reductions, carbon pricing or carbon taxes, carbon trading. Um, obviously, it won't work in isolation, but we, we don't seem to be able to keep 1.5 alive without it on a massive scale. Um, Jules, I'd like to go to you um, initially for your kind of view on obviously the, the clean tech perspective on how how the UTS um, in its current state is working um, for you um, and how it could be improved, perhaps. Sure. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. And uh, thanks for having me today. Um, so maybe just in short, a few words about clean tech for Europe. We're an initiative uh, set up by the clean tech group with support from Bill Gates founded Breakthrough Energy and representing uh, 12 of the EU's leading clean tech venture capitalists uh, and obviously the you know, more than 300 startups and scale ups that they are invested in. Um, so all that to say we represent really the early stage uh, technologies in, uh, in the EU and our main mission is to help them scale up um, to make sure that uh, they contribute to the ambitious uh, climate goals that uh, Antoine just, uh, just outlined. Um, so our initial um, <clears throat> report and analysis of the EU ecosystem is that we're fantastic at this kind of early stage innovation. We have all the technologies we need uh, to decarbonize, but uh, unfortunately, we still struggle to scale them um, and uh, really to take them from the uh, demonstration uh, um, stage to the kind of fully mature, uh, fully deployed throughout the EU um, stage. And one of the uh, key elements to get there, in our opinion, is uh, the lack of strong demand signals for clean technologies and the fact that the green premium is still very, very high um, you know, between the kind of green uh, technology and their kind of current high polluting alternative. And there, I think ETS is a fantastic tool uh, to close that, um, um, you know, that, that, that cost uh, gap and to make sure that all of these technologies become, um, you know, have a much stronger demand signal. So how do we get there? Obviously having a high carbon price is, uh, is important, um, but actually to encourage investment uh, into these clean technologies, you need to have some kind of a floor, right? To make sure that um, investors have the stability uh, to invest in these technologies. And in addition to a floor, if we can't get there, I think Antoine was mentioning uh, carbon contracts for a difference. And there, that could be a really a super mechanism to um, to scale up uh, innovative technologies. Um, and um, of course, we've both kind of touched on um, carbon removal there as much as um, carbon pricing. And um, Max, what what's your view on this? Um, I know you have some some thoughts on carbon removals. Um, do, do we need so perhaps it's not more kind of regulatory sandboxes because we've got enough on the the kind of in a very early stage but how how do we scale up carbon removal yeah thank you um uh, elizabeth um i speak here on behalf of iss ESG. we are one of the large uh, data and service providers um for the financial industry uh and uh so a lot of you know my my views are shaped by by talking to to our investor clients I, I wanted to comment actually on your previous question, if I may, um, because I found that an interesting one, the, you know, the EU ETS versus carbon tax is what is better. And in, in theory, the EU ETS is a very powerful system, right? Unlike a tax, it, there's a carbon budget, there's a price on carbon, it follows market mechanisms, it triggers transformation because ideally, you know, um, you can not only uh, lower your cost, but you can also uh, get money, make money to transform faster. Um, but in practice, uh, when I look at the EU ETS back uh, over the last decades, it, it was a failed system for the longest time, right? The price was never reflective of the actual cost of carbon. And between the early 2000 and 2018, um, the price knew more or less only one direction, which was downwards, whereas uh, greenhouse gas emissions went up. So um, in effect, the, the, the price was meaningless, and to Jules point, it didn't trigger that uh, that demand that that he's looking for. This is of course now changing since about two thousand and eighteen, but it seems to me that the that the system still has to prove itself, right? It still has to prove that it is um, uh, that it is working, triggering the change that it was set up for. 
Um, uh, taxes, on the other hand, you know, are obviously more simple. They include all industries. We, we heard Antoine talking about how how the ETS gets enlarged, um, and and I think a, a an interest, a formed out tax system that that changes consumer behavior. You know, if you feel at the gas pump by paying your tax carbon tax, um, what the what the prices that you're actually paying that could be. An, uh, an interesting instrument from the regulator's perspective. So I could imagine a world where, where governments use actually both, where they use a cap and trade system between companies, which is in essence what it is, and a carbon tax that hits everyone who has a high carbon lifestyle um, and puts the money into the pockets of, of the governments to, to finance the energy transition. That wasn't your question. I know you asked me about removals because that's a topic that I feel strongly about, but I just wanted to, maybe I pause here and then I go to removals later if somebody, you know, if Ben or so or, or Antoine have 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 used on that. That's that no, that's super interesting actually. I think I mean, does anyone else see a world where um EU member states are using both the, the ETS and carbon carbon taxes? I think maybe some examples of that already. Um, I'm happy to, to give a quick comment there. I think the the, 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 the worry that we have when we start talking about taxes is that, unfortunately, you know, a tax is a, um, you know, can, can penalize the, the consumer at a, uh, a very, in a, in a day to day way, but not necessarily change the long term incentives to have them switch to either, you know, whether it's an electric car or a clean um, fuel heating system for, for, for their house. So I think if, you know, in the context of taxes, if they come to pass, I think they need to come with very strong financial incentives for, uh, for consumers to be able to finance all these, uh, these changes. And it's an interesting point. Andrew. My, my fear would of course be that a carbon tax, if it ends up in a governmental budget is unlike a cap and trade system, not being used to address the topic of climate change, but to help pensions or to finance, you know, traditional agriculture or whatever, you know, taxpayer money is used for. So I, th I think there's also a lot of questions about the design, but I, I just find it an interesting, you know, I found the question from Elizabeth an interesting one. Is there a trade-off between uh, ETS and, and taxes? Yeah, that, that tax revenue could end up inadvertently, as you say, if going to agriculture, kind of cancelling out the benefit of taxing that carbon in the first place. Um, yeah, it, it's not simple. Um, and um, obviously, um, carbon trading is such a huge, huge subject. And I feel like we could talk about it for the, the full 50 minutes, uh, but, but that's not what we're here to do. Um, and um, Ben, I know you have a lot of thoughts about kind of... Um, the, what, what's needed outside of just climate policy. And um, Antoine did kind of touch on that. Um, if you could talk a bit about kind of, of, of what else we need to be thinking about here beyond just climate, because I do think that, you know, we, as I said, carbon trading could just take up, take up whole conversations. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, so I come at this from, from a sustainability think tank perspective, but also with the work I'm doing on the platform of sustainable finance, where we're at the minute focused on other environmental objectives beyond climate. And I think this is relevant to the, the question you asked before about carbon removals as well, is we talk a lot about climate. Obviously the climate um, challenge is urgent. We need to act now, we need to act quickly and so on. But so too is the protection of ecosystems, water and our other natural resources. And that's part of what we see built into the Fit for 55 package they are themselves affected by the volatile nature of climate change. We heard that in some of the earlier presentations earlier in the day, um, floods, droughts, fires, diseases, uh, and so on. But they're also critical in mitigating climate change itself. And this is where, for me, it gets really interesting that through things like natural carbon sinks, natural carbon removals, as well as improving resilience, um, so what we do to address climate and the signals that we give to different economic actors, economic activities. We've got to include the right signals for the other environmental objectives as well, because a bit like this conversation, there's a risk we just talk and focus on climate. And climate's, climate's kind of an odd environmental objective, and it's, it's not always compatible with the other ones. We can do things for climate that, that actually could be the detriment of biodiversity, they could be the detriment of water and so on. And, and we've seen some of that in the past in in the way we've approached some elements of agriculture, for example, um, being more efficient can involve using more energy. It can involve uh, risk to soils and so on and so forth. And they prevent, present an inherent risk then if, they're, if we just address climate in isolation. And one thing we've been thinking about is this, this idea of double materiality in finance and climate risk. 
I think we can apply that same or similar view or concept to climate action and other environmental objectives that, that what we do for climate should have some benefit for environmental objectives and other environmental objectives like uh, natural carbon sinks, biodiversity, ecosystems, and they in turn then have an impact back on climate action. So they work more synergistically together. So how we get that into the financial signals and, and markets is one of the crucial things we're, we're trying to focus on at the minute. Ben, can I, can I ask, um, sure. because in the, in the pre-discussion, we did talk about, um, uh, about uh, carbon removals, right? And I'd be interested in your thought on that, because what, I, what I'm really concerned about is um, the net zero pledges that we see out there talk only mm. about removals even though net zero, of course, means that we also need to remove emissions from the atmosphere. And I think Antoine um, commented on, on, the, on the targets of, uh, in, in the EU to, uh, on carbon sinks, which are currently defined as you know, um, natural carbon sinks, so forests, oceans, uh, agriculture, and so on. But, um, but it seems that the, that the challenge um, of magnitude is so big that you know, planting trees alone wouldn't help because I, I, I forgot I read it in some study just uh, you know, net zero for Shell would mean planting a forest in the size of Brazil or something like that. So, um, so it seems that this focus on technology is still missing, that, which is the third way to to remove greenhouse gas emissions, right? Carbon capture technology that then you know can be uh, used in all ways, but uh, all sorts of ways. But I can tell from an from the investor point of view, um, all the focus right now is under the headline net zero on reduction, but not on removal. So this mm -hmm. is almost like an elephant in the room where in two, three, four years, somebody will say, well, if we really want to get to net, we need to also deal with the emissions that have already been released. Um, and, and not only the ones that, uh, that, that need to be reduced. What's, what's your view on that? Yeah, great point. I would add one, one additional thing. So we talk about, if you want to really get to net zero, you've got to prevent emissions as much as possible. You've got to reduce the emissions. So, so don't let emissions happen. So don't, you know, using an easy example, don't cut down forests. So you stop the emissions there or don't release um, emissions from coal or something like that. Reduce them as much as we can to the extent that we can. So reducing emissions where we're undertaking activities that are leading to emissions. And that's the one that, as you say, people focus on that in, in net zero. And then where well, we can't prevent or we can't reduce anymore, then we've got to remove emissions from the atmosphere or particularly remove carbon. And then you're into um kind of a cyclical thing of well you can do that through some natural carbon um removals and part of that process is keeping those systems alive now bolstering them making them more resilient so that you can still have that ongoing removal but then as you say there's going to be a need probably for some form of technology some form of stimulus to capture emissions and actively take them out at a rate that we can't currently do through nature-based solutions at the minute, particularly if we're going to reach our targets for 2030 and 2050. Um, and that's building in a certain, in my view, building in a certain degree of, we make a lot of good pleasures, we have a lot of good ambition, but often we struggle to meet our targets. Um, so throwing more at this, more options, more solutions is only, can only help, I think. And maybe, so, sorry, a little bit. I know you're, you're the one to ask the questions, but this is something that excites me. So, uh, Antoine, is, is there is there any um, any logic in the uh, carbon removal discussion to make these early stage projects investable from from a government perspective? Because a lot of these technologies just don't exist yet, right? And and it's uh, they are, you know, in in a venture phase, if at all, maybe um, maybe even before in feasibility studies or so. Yes, I mean, I just want to to correct a bit the, the point on the, the fact that we don't uh, uh, we, we are not looking at technology enough. I think on the contrary, with uh, all we're doing uh, with Horizon Europe in particular, mm -hmm. which is not very much targeted at the Green Deal. There is a lot going on here on, on technology. Uh, that being said, I mean, our our plans do not rely on on uh, you know, things that have not been completely uh, proven yet. Uh, so when we made the, the climate target plan, obviously, we, you know, we think the way to get there, uh, and there's a very clear case for that, is, is that we need a, a very strong uh, contribution also of, uh, of natural things. And we ab absolutely need to, as I said, not only preserve 
the natural sinks, but actually increase uh, their contribution. It's one of the major, I think, policy challenges uh, that we have. And, and this is also what we're trying to deliver with this package. Now, in terms of what we do, I mean, you, you've seen that uh, in, the, uh, in the EU, we do a lot of uh, research uh, funding indeed, but we also uh, have instruments that go uh, now closer to, to market. Uh, we go towards, uh, you know, demonstration with things like the innovation fund, etc. And I think these type of tools could be further used, uh, of course, in the, in the future. Uh, and actually what we're proposing to do is to, you know, increase the, the amounts uh, as part of the, mm. of the package, because we know there's a strong effort needed in, in industry in particular. But I think the, the general approach that we have um, uh, is one that looks uh, positively at the contribution of technology and that seeks to look at, you know, every, every possible solution that can contribute, but also staying, uh, you know, realistic and looking at what the science tells us, what the uh, current uh, state of technology can tell us about what we can, uh, you know, what we can base our plans on uh, at this very moment. And I think the, appro the approach we have at the moment is reasonable uh, in that respect. And on that, actually, and I know... Yeah, just. Can I go, Elizabeth? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just just to pick up on, on that conversation. So on the, the early stage uh, technology side, uh, what's taking place at the moment, um, on the industrial side and the, the, the capture and the removal technology, um, Max, I mean, it, it's the technology is ready, right? It, it works. Um, it's just extremely expensive. So our, our ability to scale it up uh, in time for it to be a credible solution uh, for me is the is the question on the the natural sinks uh, side there are also kind of earlier stage um, technologies um, that could um, you know help us have natural sinks be a bigger part of the strategy with carbon farming for instance um, and um, you know helping the EU's farmers adopt um, farming practices that just allow us to to lock more uh, carbon in the soil but again, you know, the, the, the monitoring and the, the reporting, the verification technologies for, for these are still uh, quite early stage. Um, but, but I think super promising. Um, the, the, the overall message that we would have for, for this is, um, you know, there is no miracle solution. Um, there, there will be a lot of communications on these removal technologies and natural sinks um, as, you know, kind of um, the, the, the solution to, to get to net zero. But in our experience, um, avoiding emissions and working on emissions avoidance pays off much faster uh, than some of these. So I'll take the example of cement, for instance. If you um, manage to produce a cement with a, a much smaller proportion of clinker, which is totally possible with the technology that we have today, it's just not incentivized, but it's possible. Um, you have a cement that is much, much greener. Uh, and um, you actually are able to do that at a, at a much, much better cost than if you do, you know, the traditional clinker production and then put uh, carbon capture at the other tail end of it. So in, just, in a lot of these industries, it's about, um, you know, just changing the status quo and moving mm -hmm. to a technology that allows us to, to, to do, you know, um, emissions avoidance uh, at, at the start. I mean, I, I sorry. <laughs> Uh, just just one, one forecast, so you hear me say it here. Um, I think that institutional investors in the future, all those that signed net, uh, net zero pledges, will have a huge interest in investing in removals and sinks in a few years' time. And currently, the technology isn't investable yet, you know, because it is so early stage. So I think this is a great opportunity for, you know, um, for the Commission, for Cleantech for Europe or so, to help get the, get these uh, technologies, you know, through innovation ready for investments because um, uh, this 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 will just be a, a big topic for everyone who has signed a net zero pledge because that because reducing a loan will not deliver on the pledge okay sorry Elizabeth. <laughs> no that's all right i was just I'm, I'm actually thinking about everything that you guys are saying and i like i'm inclined to think that actually i think that net zero corporate net zero pledges are actually too reliant on these magic solutions that maybe do exist in, at a very small scale, but as we know, I don't know, but the, one of the first carbon removal, I remember seeing a story about this, it was removing something like, a, I don't know, a thousandth of the carbon in the atmosphere or something smaller. Um, 
is, is, is one of the solutions here, is it being tougher on companies that make these net zero pledges that are based on um, replanting forests the size of Brazil? Like, do, do we need to regulate the offsets market more clearly? Do we need to tell companies that they cannot base their net zero pledges on things that don't exist or don't exist at the scale that we need? Would that incentivize? Because um, I think that, you know, you know, carbon removal is a great, um, if, if this all works, then that, that's great. But it's missing a conversation about the fact that behaviours need to change and we need to consume less, right? Anyone wants to take that? I can pick up that briefly from the kind of taxonomy perspective. I think, yeah, it's always nice to say, yeah, let's let's be tougher on companies. But what we're trying to do through the taxonomy is just give a clear direction, clear signposting about what is then compatible with getting to net zero. What are the activities that that you can actually invest in in a no regrets way that are going to deliver the carbon um, the climate benefits that we're looking for it it i think in coupled with that is having also clear trajectories about what net zero looks like for different sectors of the economy as well because or even country level because it's it's not always clear it's, it's often quite different um and more work on that side was would help us then look at and be able to benchmark well are they going in the right direction? Does the pledge actually make sense? Um, and then I think, yeah, being a bit tougher in terms of saying, right, we're going to hold you to account to this and we're actually going to be able to monitor and measure this and see if you're getting there at, at measurable interviews, so intervals, so we know we're going, um, going in the right direction. Um Maybe a quick, quick reaction to that, and I think it also um, uh, resonates with a, a question from the audience right now. I totally agree that the, the taxonomy is the, in a way, the, the tool that kind of helps us helps us get there uh, on, on not necessarily being tougher on on corporates, but um, uh, kind of you know giving them the the, the roadmap um, or the scope of activities that they should invest in. Um, I would say that. The, you know the problem is if we start to include things like natural gas in the in the taxonomy, we completely lose that uh, that roadmap. I think we'll have to be very vigilant in the in the months to come to say, okay, what are actually the uh, the technologies we want to invest in? Uh, let's make sure that these are included in the scope, but let's also make sure that um, you know we don't invest in kind of suboptimal uh, paths here. Um, just one um, quick point on clean technologies and their relationship with the, the taxonomy. Uh, we released a, a response to the latest public consultation from the um, um, from the platform recently. And our study basically showed that about half of the clean technologies that are in our um, members' portfolios are currently not uh, covered in the, the scope of the Delegated Act um, or the, the, the latest uh, kind of extension proposal. So I think the, the taxonomy is really a, a seminal, super important piece of work. We just need to make sure that all the technologies we need to, to get to net zero uh, are, are eligible there. Yeah, but as, as we're on the subject of the taxonomy, perhaps we'll take this question now, which I believe is for Antoine. Um, so in the tools accompanying the Fit for 55 package, the EU taxonomy is much discussed. Uh, will the commission create a new intermediate category to accommodate fossil gas and nuclear as suggested by Commissioner McGuinness, otherwise including fossil gas and nuclear would be greenwashing, destroying the credibility of this tool and the Green Deal. Um, over to you, Antoine. Yeah. Um, well, first, I mean, the taxonomy is is a is a market uh, transparency tool. It's a, it's a compass. I mean, it is uh, uh, very much aimed at uh, you know providing um, the criteria that makes uh, activities uh, let's say compatible with our climate objectives, and it's you know in reference to the one point five degree uh, goal. Um, so it, it's really focused on uh, on substantial contributions. You know, also the, the do no significant harm requirement, which I think echoes a bit what was uh, said earlier about the importance of other um, environmental objectives and, and and the need to keep a coherent approach between the climate objective and, and others. So this is a bit the, the yardstick. Uh, obviously, the the issue of uh, natural gas and nuclear. You know that we have um, said in in April uh, that we will uh, consider uh, these issues. That we will look at them. We had uh, on uh, on nuclear uh, a process with uh, 
with uh, experts who produced uh, reports, etc. So the Commission will uh, will uh, soon uh, uh, need to to decide on this. Uh, all I can say is that I mean the the, the taxonomy serves a, a very clear purpose. There's also quite a clear uh, legal framework. Uh, so we need to, to carefully look at uh, uh, those issues, uh, but I'm not in a position to say today, you know, what will be the, the decision on this. You know that there are very diverging views, um, especially across uh, member states um, in, the, in the European Union. Um, but again, we need to look at this in an objective way, looking at the, the purpose of the taxonomy and also at the criteria which are set in the law, in the, in the taxonomy regulation. What I, what I find quite interesting is um, the, the taxonomy is, of course, aimed at uh, companies, but also as, at investors, right? And the report that was launched by Eurosif, um today, when I, when I read it, I found um, one aspect quite interesting. There's this, there's this underlying question in the report, does the current financial market regulation really trigger change in the real economy? So, or in other words, if real world emission reduction is the aim, is the current financial market, in this case, regulation fit for purpose? And the report seems to conclude that this is not fully the case yet. It, it says, you know, regulation focuses on transparency, but should maybe also consider focusing on shifting money. You know, I don't know if the regulator wants to do that or not. That would be quite quite a step. You, you mentioned, Antoine, it's more about transparency, but that's what the report is, 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 is pointing out. And um, it's focusing on public equity, which is a secondary market where buying or selling a stock has little impact on the on the underlying um, company. You know, the, the company still exists when I sell a stock or uh, I need to find somebody. And so the, the report makes the case that investors should engage with companies they own to create this real economy link. And this is also, you know, what we observe at our firm at ISS ESG is, is just that. Our investor clients ask us to engage on their behalf with companies on certain topics, such as net zero. And then we pool different clients to make uh, clear to the company that we speak on behalf of a range of investors, this kind of pooled engagement logic that also exists, for example, in Climate Action 100 Plus. And Climate Action 100 Plus has shown that sometimes engagement is a bit of a, of a dead end um, for some companies, when a company doesn't move despite this collective effort, and for those cases, investors can now also, and this is something that I that, that I found was maybe somewhat missing from the report, investors can also use their vote um, since a few years. So they can vote at the annual general meeting in line with their, for example, climate conviction. Climate doesn't have to be an item to be voted on. The investor just might just vote against the re-election of a director due to, you know, the, the, the climate performance or so. So, um, Two points here, really. One is this, uh, you know, the, the triggered by the taxonomy. Um, it's a transparency focus, um, and there is this this underlying voice. Shouldn't there be more? And then, uh, secondly, uh, the case that that uh, engagement could really create this link um, when we only focus on public equities. And yeah, just to say that I I, I fully agree. Um, uh, on with the, the stress and the importance of engage of engagement, uh, indeed. Uh, I mean, uh, I, 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 I will not uh, say that our framework on sustainable finance currently is, is complete. It's an ongoing uh, effort. The taxonomy is one very important tool uh, in that effort, but it's, it's also one of the tools. We, we still have important work to do uh, on, uh, I would say, uh, not only you know promoting uh, green investment, but making sure that uh, that risks are properly integrated in the financial system, uh, and, and looking also at, at prudential aspects, we we need to look also at these engagement issues and, and stewardship. Uh, I think in the future we need to look at uh, things like ESG ratings. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, it's, uh, it's an, uh, an agenda that will keep, I think, the, the Commission and the EU institutions busy uh, for, for some years, uh, as you can see in the latest uh, strategy that we've uh, published. Just a, a quick reaction to, to, to your point, uh, uh, Max. Um, so, so we've looked uh, in, in quite a lot of depth as at kind of what is happening in the, the financial system in the EU as it relates to clean tech innovation. And obviously that's a subset of the broader climate conversation, but I think an, an interesting one to, to bring up here. 
Um, our analysis shows that, you know, if we compare ourselves to uh, the US or the UK, um, again, in that kind of scale up uh, bucket, we're really, really struggling. And one of the, the causes for that is that um, obviously we're weaker in terms of public markets. Um, so our you know, clean tech uh, startups and scale ups are having a much harder time listing on exchanges and getting coverage and, uh, and getting uh, kind of funding that way. But also our institutional investors are much less invested in the field. Right. So um, if you look at insurances, at banks, at pension funds, um, they are very used to investing in private equity and in buyout, but much less in, in venture capital, for instance, and especially in, in, uh, in the clean technology space. So how do we find ways in the EU to, to, to bring more of that money towards green technology development, I think is, a, is, is absolutely critical. And there, you know, obviously, taxonomy can help, um, but you know, disclosures, articles 8 and 9 could, could help as well. Um, and just in, in signaling kind of um, you know, easier fundraising for, for the, the, the fund managers that are really kind of best in class and, and investing in the, the, the right technologies. Just to go back on the the, the, the question of, of taxonomy um, and what to include in there to to, to uh, kind of react to the uh, to the question from the audience, um, you know I think that there is this idea that taxonomy should be science driven and science based, right? Um, and there I would almost kind of split the question in terms of nuclear and gas, where nuclear, uh, it, you know I think the the issue is not necessarily the carbon abatement. Carbon abatement is fantastic. The issue is more on security and on uh, safety for for users. I think on gas, I mean, I, you know, um, I understand the, the, the political concern um, and, uh, and alignment among member states, but, it, you know, I think scientifically it's, it's hard to, uh, to defend that it, uh, it's helping towards the transition. And that's that, that's not just about um, like getting money to these new technologies, right? It's uh, if, if these new technologies are indeed the future, then it's arguably about kind of pension funds missing out on that. Um, that being part of that future, if they're, especially if they're con continuing to invest in fossil fuels. I think, I mean, you know, to in, in defense of some of, especially the pension funds, they follow very strict guidelines of what they can and cannot invest in, right? And and the portion of the, of, depending on the country where you're in, the, the amount of money in percentage that you can invest in, uh, in anything that is kind of, uh, you know, uh, alternative asset classes can be very, very slim. And obviously, you have to generate returns. Venture capital is is qu quite often, uh, you know, a very risky investment today. But I wanted to I wanted to pick up on on uh, on another um, of Jules uh, Jules' comments there. The the report that we are that we are launching today here, or that we are looking at today here, that was launched, is also focusing a lot of public equities because regulation currently is also strongly focused on public equities but to have a direct impact on the economy as mentioned before you can you can engage and you can vote but you can also use other asset classes that have this direct impact right as a, as a private equity investor as a venture cap, venture capital investor you might either finance new technologies or in private equity you 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 might have a seat on the board and you can help the company adopt the climate strategy um, and so on as a debt provider as a bank you can increase the cost of capital for climate harming and decrease the cost of capital for for climate helping investments and so on so i think these areas um the regulator is looking at that especially with you know in, in the context of um banking uh, climate stress tests and so on but i think this is um this is still underexplored from the point of view of how to create a real economy impact because some of these asset asset classes although smaller might have uh, a larger real economy impact and also from an investor's perspective yeah i mean i mean what, what would your view be on that argument that um and i think you kind of alluded to this earlier max that um oh it's great if someone divests from fossil fuels but if someone else buys them you know it has no big impact i mean that the, the argument there seems to go around in a circle and come back to, OK, well, we need real world economy regulation that says you just can't do that anymore. Right. Well, I, I, you know, I think I think there's one one thing that um, that I think is sometimes overlooked. A lot of investors are dealing with the topic of climate change from a risk perspective and not necessarily from an impact yeah. perspective. They don't yeah. see their role as making the world a better place. They see their role as understanding there's a risk and I need to adjust my investments. We see that with a lot of our clients as well. And by divesting, they are decreasing their risk. If, yeah. if there's an energy transition and you are not invested in companies that will get hit, you have de-risked your portfolio. And that's 
that's fine. You know, there's there's nothing wrong about that. You know, this is uh, the the mandate of an of an institutional investor is not necessarily to um, to execute policy. You know, that uh, that is sometimes you know that depends on where you are on the investor space. Some investors see that as their role, others don't see that as their role. And I think sometimes there is a disconnect between the focus on impact that uh, you know that is a societal goal and the focus on risk that is sometimes an investor's mandate you know depending on how you see your mandate can i come back in on this on the the kind of tension between finance regulation and, and sectoral policy because it, mm. it it's interesting listening to this and i think what we've seen within our institute working on this working on environmental policy for the last 40 years is regulation works for sure we need more regulate or we need better regulation, more regulation. But in in the context sort of public policy, it's really hard to get very good regulation in place. And once even any regulation once it's in place, it's quite hard to change, particularly as as we get new priorities, as we have new urgency around the priorities that we have, like climate uh, and other things. What's interesting I find in this space is finance policy, things like taxonomy, other things in relation to investments and, and signaling for, um, uh, for major major financial institutions is going a lot quicker, and that's what's quite exciting from a from a policy perspective. Is we're we're looking at well, what is a genuine substantial contribution to climate in the absence of any baggage that's linked to existing sectoral policies? But in that sense, then you've got a real tension in that you've got industrial actors, companies, etc., responding then to two different signals. You've got an existing industry policy or existing sectoral policy saying one thing, and then a finance policy which might be saying more ambitious things going beyond that. And for me, then the sectoral policies need to align with what we're saying in finance to bring them kind of up to speed with that. But it's tricky then because you're then ta talking about two different pots of money you've got public money then you've got private investments and then how you speed those things up is a real challenge and I, I guess that's one that Antoine and others are dealing with quite live in the commission at the moment yeah would anyone want to add anything there I mean just just a quick reaction but more to, to Max's point um, and you know I completely agree with you I think we need to, to help institutional investors, insurance banks, understand how to invest in the transition. It's not about, you know, uh, placing blame at all. I think it's it's really about building the capacity on their end to confidently invest in some of these sectors, right? And I think we've done a, a very poor job at that in the past. Um, so, you know, for instance, um, you know, some of these funds could co-invest uh, with the EIF in some of the fund of fund mandates that they have um, that are very kind of clean tech oriented, right? And that's kind of an, an easy first step for some of these institutional investors looking for um, kind of partners that that they know well. Um, but uh, I think yeah. there's also a regulatory aspect to that in terms of, um, as you say, kind of prudential um, mandates and making sure that these companies can you know, have the, the, the rights to invest in some of these asset classes. But uh, but also, I mean, um, this is something that I observe quite strongly over the last 10 years. The discussion has really shifted from risk to opportunity. I mean, this transition ahead of us is huge. It needs a lot of money. Um, and there will be winners and losers. And investors are in the business of picking winners and avoiding losers, right? So in a way, this is, um, at least when they're when they plain vanilla, um, and so this is a huge investment opportunity, right? And so, so coming back to an earlier point, I think it is it is a lot about making these solutions investable. It's also on on companies to show to their investors that by in, by investing in these companies, you are you are participating in the in the the opportunities that come with the transition. And I think this is this is something that is unfolding as we speak at a very fast speed, and it uh, I, I find that very exciting to see. I think we are just about at time. Um, so thank you all so much um, for that. And um, I thank you again to Eurosif. Um, we are now handing over to Eurosif President Will Alton for some closing comments. Um, thank you all so much, Ben, Jules, Antoine, and um, thank you. Well, thank you, Lizzie, um, and well done for managing such a lively panel to finish our proceedings today. Um, that was a great job. I had the pleasure of opening uh, our session today and also have the pleasure of, of closing. Um, so much 
was discussed today that was hugely valuable, I'm sure, to all the participants and hopefully gave you some insights you might not have had on many of uh, the discussions and debates going on across uh, across Europe right now in terms of sustainable finance. It really shows today our discussions that the challenges and the potential for success of the policy mechanisms and the regulation that is both in flight, but also um, we are about to see play out over the next few years. I thought some points just, just worth um, reiterating from the discussions this morning. In the first panel, um, the benefits of corporate engagement, which was a feature which appeared again in the, in the final panel, um, and how important it is for investors to have um, an escalation process, setting priorities and objectives for engagement with companies and utilizing the power of proxy voting, um, which is an asset to shareholders in listed companies, as we know. But one key point, which is very close to Eurosif's mandate, is the engagement with policymakers. One of the things we hear often from policymakers is that we never hear from investors in um, talking to us about what they want from regulation. This is a role that Eurosif uh, can play on behalf of uh, many of the uh, investors across the European bloc. And I just urge you again to review the recommendations in our report today, which are aimed at um, policymakers. Feedback or comments would be delighted to hear from you as to whether you support them or any other ideas you may have. In the second panel, ESG data, which is obviously a topic, um, particularly with the requirements around SFDR, um, that uh, financial market participants will have to disclose um, the principal adverse sustainability impacts, which are mandated. There's a lot of debate about the relevance of some of those and the quality of those data sets um, as they exist today. So the challenge of how do we get better data from companies is real and will be with us for many um, years to come. And it's a particularly um, a challenging issue for those uh, participants promoting and selling financial products into Europe, where they may not solely comprise of European companies, they may be global portfolios or with emerging market exposure, where standards of disclosure can vary. So a real challenge. It was also good to see uh, the discussion around SFDR on the Article 8 and 9 differentiation. And the, the, the comments around is Article 9 really just going to be fit for thematic funds or do we need further clarity on a distinction between the, those two categories? And the issue around transition, we hear a lot about climate transition as a key part of our debate and should that be given more visibility? In the final panel, which I think, again, was an excellent way to, to wrap up today, um, it, it's it's bewildering the amount of uh, work that the Commission is undertaking in so many different aspects <clears throat> through the Green uh, Deal and other uh, mechanisms and levers that the Commission is working on. Keeping up with that is, is a real challenge for any industry practitioner. And, and again, this is something where Eurosip can be a benefit uh, to members uh, in consolidating and communicating in hopefully a digestible and understandable way what is happening in this very complex landscape that we are in uh, and will be in for some years to come. The issues around carbon price in the ETS and whether that's fit for purpose was an interesting discussion, but particularly around net, the net zero debate which is highly topical with the commitments we are seeing from many participants across the world, not only in Europe, uh, but many of which lack any substance or, or detail at the moment. Um, and I was particularly pleased to hear about the, 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 the issues of removal, and particularly things like where the oceans can play a role in that as a huge carbon sink that often gets missed from our debates around uh, climate. Often the focus is on terrestrial solutions and natural capital sinks, but we have this huge um, ocean uh, asset which can help with that too. And it's important we keep that um, sustainable and healthy to help in the fight against climate. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the discussion today. Um, thank you all for joining us. I hope you will join us for our next report um, in a year's time when we will continue to monitor the success and the challenges and other uh, of the EU's regulatory framework and as that plays out. The Eurosif team are 
delighted to hear from anybody with comments or feedback on our work. Please do uh, contact Victor and the team. Uh, any feedback from today would be extremely welcome as well. Thank you once again to the sponsors of the report we mentioned earlier uh, for, for enabling us to deliver the report today. Hopefully you will again find it useful and informative and it will trigger some um, discussion and debate within your own organizations. So Eurosif, we're here to help. Uh, the team's here to help. We know the challenges ahead. Um, we also know the opportunities ahead if we get these regulatory frameworks and other mechanisms right or as right as they can possibly be. So on that note, thank you on behalf of the team. Thank you for joining us and I wish you all a good day. Goodbye.